Great. Yeah, well, I'll just go ahead and uh, and kick it off then. All right. And I promise I won't make any Dave Grohl jokes. That's all right, man. I, I saw you get that every, quite every, a bit, right? <laughs> every every gig that I've ever been to, I get that. <laughs> Other worst <laughs> Which thing, is ridiculous. You know? Like, what the fuck is Dave Grohl doing at some <laughs> metal band gig in Melbourne? You know, like, but I still get asked. Oh, my friend, sweet. my friends have been conditioned now. I've got a buddy that I go, I've known him forever and I go to every gig with him. And whenever someone comes up and asks, he just kind of looks at them and, and puts his finger to his lips <laughs> and shakes his head back. Like, oh, shit. <laughs> oh, a bunch of us were reading uh, Empire of the Vampire on the Discord. And a lot of people, I guess, it was the first time they'd read your stuff. And, they, and everyone was like, does this guy look like Dave Grohl anyone else? And then I saw your Instagram and I saw you said like, yeah, I know. Shut the fuck up about it already. <laughs> so- yeah, man. I, I had uh, my dad, when, when I was first starting out as a baby author, my i got my first author photo taken and i sent it to my dad um along with a pic of dave Grohl right next to it like that that joke meme that i that i printed out and uh just sent it to him for a joke and he said yeah those photos are really good you should use the one that's on the right and the one <laughs> on the right was dave and he wasn't he wasn't being sarcastic that's great she <laughs> thought it was me so you know if my dad Pulls for it, then I don't blame regular. Well, I could say there's probably it. worse comparisons. You know, I, I got told one time sure. like Louis C.K. or something. I was like, ah, oh, well, I need to lose some weight, you know? So. Yeah, for real. <laughs> Hey, what's up, bookworms? We are back with another author interview today. Today, the New York Times bestselling author of The Nevernight Chronicle, Aurora Cycle, Empire of the Vampire, and much, much more, Mr. Jay Kristoff. Sir, how are things down under? Good, mate. How are you? Oh, man, it's just Texas. great. It's uh, it's Texas, so we've got like 81 degrees outside. We're having short sleeves and flip-flops for Christmas. It's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I live in Melbourne, so we're supposed to be in summer here. It's That's summer right. today, but yesterday it was like different. Yeah. It was pouring with rain yesterday, man. Like it was crazy. I, I, I went out to get a Red Bull for a walk and it just started bucketing down. I was I was furious. Good times, right? <laughs> we get we get about three days of spring here in Melbourne and then maybe seven days of summer and the rest of it is just great. Yeah, about eleven and a half months of yeah. nuclear heat. Uh you know, yeah, right. That, that two weeks I grew been- I grew up on the west coast of Australia. And Perth is a lot like Texas. I've been to Texas a few times and, and Western Australia feels a lot like Texas. It's just brutal heat and, and big flat spaces. Well, I hope cool. someday to get to visit down under, but uh, you know, right now it's probably not. Yeah, you happen. should come. Yeah, I, I, would lo- I would love to. Now I want to say up front, I have only read Empire of the Vampire, but I liked it so much. I've got this on the schedule for January. So I'm very, very excited uh-huh. to do that. You got the box set. Do they, do the they match? Yes. If all do three the spines of them. match? Okay, no, for some reason match. they made this this the uh, dark dawn is white. Furious. Does what that bother you? Like, Does it bother an author oh, yeah, as much man. as it bothers a collector? The OCD in me is furious when I see that. I don't know why they did that, but it's yeah. so close. It's so close. The names match. This no. matches, but it's white. I, yeah, yeah, things like that. But okay, see, I was I, always I curious if that bothered authors as much as it bothers us collectors because. Man, oh yeah, no, it's it's yeah. That's I, infuriating. I done it that way, but you know, whatever. It's all good. It's all good. It's the way for that matter. I think for a time, what kind of put me off is I, I believe that a lot of people got this misconception that you're a, a young adult author. Do you, do you think that's unfair? Do you, do you see where that comes? I mean, from? I am. I I write both, or yeah. I wrote both. I don't I don't I don't really write YA anymore. I, I finished up my last YA series just this year, but I, I kind of had one foot in both ponds. Um, so I understand where that confusion comes from, and also. Never night, the protagonist is a teenager and she's a girl. Uh, yeah. um, and if you were to pick a random book off the shelf from a bookstore that had a teenage female protagonist, the odds are pretty damn good that it's going to be a YA novel. Yeah. So I, I get where that confusion comes from. But <laughs> I, when, I was, when I was first writing the book, I knew that confusion would kind of come around because I was writing this other series, Illuminae, at the time with a Melbourne author, Amy Coffin, and that was doing really well. So... I didn't want the same people who were reading Illuminate to pick up Nevernight and think they were getting the same thing. I was going to ask, was that, was that like the, the, the shock of a lot of people when they picked up Nevernight and they were like, oh my gosh. You know? Oh yeah. I mean, that, that was the intent behind the, the first page of Nevernight is called Caveat Emptor. It's like buyer beware. Like, and it, and it explains to you 
like the, the opening line of Nevernight has a curse word in it. It's like people often shit themselves when they die. That's the opening <laughs> line of the book. So I did that in part to let people know that they were not, <laughs> they were not That's getting safe. a YA book. This yeah, was I something kind of different. When I spoke with Joe Abercrombie, he has a, another series that is a, called YA, which is a... Which is oh, yeah, the RC Harper series. King. Yeah. And yeah, I asked yeah. him about it. I was like, what, what, what do you think about this? He's like, well, look, if you have a female protagonist that's a teenager, they're going to market it as YA to try to get those people to buy it. And he's like, I don't even odds consider good. it a young adult. So. Yeah, odds, uh, odds are good. And like you understand where that impulse comes from. Because like I say, if you pick up a random book in a store and it had a teenage female protagonist, odds are good it's going to be yeah. YA. But I mean, I mean, yeah, I, I sometimes get angry letters from parents like <laughs> who, who found out what their kids were reading and yeah, never night, never night gets pretty heavy in a lot of different ways. So I think uh, you heard me complain about how vampire stories lately that that that, that genre got hijacked from us Anne Rice fans a long time ago to where now it's just like, okay, well that's why I was apprehensive about this big boy here, and then I was like, oh no, I'm reading some of the passages from this, and um, this is not young adult paranormal teen romance, you guys. So that, that, that no, that's- it's I mean I I kind of grew up when vampires were still monsters. Yeah. Like I grew up reading Salem's Lot and Interview and watching films like Near Dark and Fright Night and that kind of stuff. So when I was a kid, vampires were the bad guys. They were monsters to be fought. So that was the kind of monster that I wanted to build. Um, you know, they're, they're not they're not caricature-ish evil. They're, they're kind of Anne Rice evil in the sense that on a long enough timeline, your morality just goes away. Like everything that you were, everything that you kind of held dear dies because you're immortal and everything else changes around you and you stop caring. Uh, you eventually stop seeing people as people and start seeing them as food. So that, you know, from the perspective of your food, that's a terribly evil mindset to have. But if you're 400 years old and you're killing somebody every night, yeah, you don't see them as people anymore. So that that's My the ears. kind of monster that I was I've trying been- to bring back. I've been waiting for this for, for vampires for so long to stop obsessing over teenage girls and get back to just, you know, I mean, that, at, that, was the in, that was the intent behind Danton. Like I, I, I should go on record and say, I am a massive vampire diaries fan. <laughs> like it's a weird thing for somebody like me to say, I am. I love Buffy. So no, no, no judgment yeah, sure. Me. My my wife loves Buffy <laughs> and I love vampire diaries, man. Like when I announced empire years ago, a bunch of my readers said, you got to watch Vampire Diaries. And I'm like, oh, I, I, like I'm, I'm a dude in my 40s. I'm not going to like this show. <laughs> a couple of writer friends of mine also said, it's really good. You should check it. And so I kind of set those preconceived notions of what it was aside and sat down and watched it. It's actually really good, man. Like if you're, it, it is a teen romance, like it is a love triangle structure and you have to be aware of that going into it. But as far as an exercise in genre fiction goes, it's incredibly well crafted. Like Julie Pleck and Rebecca Sunshine, the writers and showrunners on that show, they did an incredible job of maintaining the integrity of that core structure. Like they're exerting different pressures on it from different directions in every season so it doesn't get stale, but they never lose sight of what it was and they keep it fresh every season. Like there's cool characters in there, there's great storylines. It, it's it's really good <laughs> I, I, i'll admit yeah. I, I watched it for a few years first because i was in love with nino dobrev because i mean who isn't right but sure. i i like that the show always used like the story arcs where each season or each it like had like seven episodes of one arc and then it would move on to a new arc like for seven episodes i thought that it's was really always in motion like they that's the great thing about it like things that a lesser show would draw out over 24 episodes they do it in seven and then they just break it and and snap everything into a different position and they're constantly doing that like rewriting the paradigm it's such a cool show but like yeah my, my intent behind danton who's one of the villains in empire was a commentary on that edward cullen damon stefan salvatore paradigm where in our heads it's somehow okay for 160 year old man to be macking on a 16 year old girl and that and no one questions that like no one no one actually puts up their hand and says uh, edward cullen is actually he's a creeper like he's a pedophile he's a man trying to have sex with a with a teenage girl and that's creepy as fuck yeah. somehow that got got allocated into romance so danton is kind of my take on that character it's like an edward or a damon or a stefan kind of taken to their logical conclusion where 
you know, this pseudo romantic love just becomes destructive and horrible obsession. So yeah, that, that was kind of my, my take on that, on that villain. No, that's good. What uh, I hear, I turn villain. Never did not expect us to talk about Vampire Diaries tonight. But that's hey, that's great. I love man. I'm a massive fan. And then one of the weird thing was like I, I, I like this is this is a completely bizarre set of circumstances. But like a few months back, one of the actors from Vampire Diaries, a dude named Joseph Morgan, who played Klaus, one of the villains. Klaus, oh, okay. He was tweeting, um, and he's a massive Grimdark fan. Like he just finished reading all of Joe Abercrombie's books. He said, like, I've just finished reading, um, you know, Blade itself. Um, what else should I read? And one of my readers jumped on and said, hey, you should read Nevernight. And he, I, I tweeted back to him. I made some joke. I can't even remember what I said. And he tweeted back to me and he followed me. I'm like, oh, okay, this is weird. And so I shot him a DM and I just said, hey, man, this is, this is really random. Um, but it just so happens I have a vampire book coming out in like three weeks. And my author copy's just arrived. Do you want to read one? And he wrote back and he said, oh, yeah, sure. Send it along. Here's my agent's address. And I didn't think anything of it. I thought he's just being polite. He's just he's being a nice guy, whatever. So I sent, I sent off the book and I, and I put some note in the front cover because I had just watched some episode where, where Klaus had like drowned one of, his, one of his enemy's mothers in a fountain or something. <laughs> so I made some joke about Klaus and said that, you know, Joe would make a good game in a TV show and kind of and sent it off and didn't think anything of it. Like I kind of put it out of my head. And then like three weeks later, Joseph Morgan is on Twitter tweeting to his like couple of million followers that he's reading this book called Empire of the Vampire. And it's the best vampire book that he's ever read. Wow. And then like a week later, he finishes the book and says, you know, this, this is a masterpiece. You've got to go check it out. It's, it's the coolest vampire book I've ever read. And I know a few things about vampires or something. So that like, there was this weird confluence of events where if I hadn't have set aside these preconceived notions that Vampire Diaries was for teenage girls and sat my ass in the chair and watched it and realized how good it was, I wouldn't even know who the fuck this guy was. Right. Like He would have just been some random actor tweeting at me, but because I kind of sharpened up and said, I should give this a try, even though I think I might not like it. That led to this sequence of events where Joseph was tweeting to all these people that they should go and buy the book. And there's all kinds of cool stuff happening behind the scenes now that I can't really talk about, but it all came out of that one decision to, to not decide I didn't like a thing before I tried the thing. So yeah, that was a really valuable life lesson for me this year. And yeah, shout out to that reader who, who worded Joseph up about the books. Cause yeah, that led to a crazy sequence of events. Yeah. I'm real big about uh, trying to put your preconceived notions aside. Just give it a shot. Oh Yeah. Because I see people all the time yeah. crashing books that they've never read and they never planned to read. And I'm like, well, I mean, because I, I won't lie. Yeah. Because I felt like I wanted to be able to trash this and have like back and forth. I read the first two Twilight books and I wanted to kill myself. But, you know, I did read them. <laughs> but I was like, I'm not going to just trash these like everyone else without reading any of it. And then I'm like, well, I probably should have. I, I haven't read Twilight. I, I made a joke on a podcast a few months back that I would watch Twilight if someone, like the, the two guys, the two main actors from Vampire Diaries, Ian Summerholder and God, I can't remember the dude who plays Stefan. Sorry. Um, they make a bourbon. It's called Brothers Bond. They like they make they make their own bourbon. Wow. And so I said, if someone sent me a bottle of that, I would sit and watch the first Twilight movie and drink the bottle and and live Instagram while I'm watching the film. And someone <laughs> someone sent me a bottle of it. So oh, I've man. actually got to watch Twilight now. But my artist Bon, uh, who did the illustrations in Empire. She's a massive Twilight fan and like she's an art student. She, she doesn't approach it from like a fangirlish standpoint. She's actually like a student of film and whatever. And she says as a piece of film, it's actually it really well put together. Like the first Twilight movie is apparently it's not a big budget Hollywood blockbuster thing. It's almost like an art house indie film because they made it on like this low budget. It wasn't the books weren't huge at the time. So it kind of got put together in the same way that an indie film would and it has an indie film vibe. So. I'm actually really interested to watch it, and again, I'm you know, trying not to decide what it is before I before well, just I just make sure that you uh that chair. you you bring the bottle with you, and you don't have to. Yeah, it. no, I'm bringing the bottle. Yeah, you no, might you I'll, might you I'll might need it a little it bit. <laughs> I did read your your Twitter story about how you became a Stephen King fan. Don't know, I'm one of the hugest Stephen King fans that there is. Sure, I've, I've been raised on this guy basically. So everything he ever is writing, I'm going to read. He could write his uh you know his grocery list, and I'm going to read that. And that's just kind of how I am. So I want to say, um, uh, I, while I know that, I, what would you say if you had to pick a favorite book by him? Do you think you could? And also, just what ways has he influenced you as a writer? Salem's Lot. 
Salem's Lot, hands down. Like Salem's Lot was the first time I saw myself in a book. Like I used to, it's a weird story. My mum used to do the grocery shopping every week. She would take me with her um, and she would drop me off at a news agency. I don't even know if people know what news agencies are anymore, but there used to be shops in shopping malls that would sell like magazines and newspapers and books. My mum would drop me off at this this news agency and go and do the shopping. Um, and I was like 10 years old at the time. And I would sit myself down in the book aisle and I would pick a Stephen King book off the shelf and I would just read it for an hour. And then when mum came to grab me, I would get a piece of my bus ticket and I would stick it in the page and put the book at the back of the stack so no one would buy it in the intervening week. And then I'd come back next week and reach to the back and grab the book and then keep reading. And I read like Stephen King's whole backlog that way. But yeah, like, Salem's Lot was my favorite. Like the first time that I saw Mark Petrie, like that was me. He's the little nerdy kid who collected, you know, action figures and read scary horror comics. And he was the kid who figured out what was happening in this town before all the adults did. Like he was my guy. So yeah. And like, it's weird. I haven't actually read Salem's Lot, man, probably 20 years. And I can still quote lines from that book to this day. Yeah, I reread um, yeah. it in about 2016. It's it's still awesome. I mean, I don't know what else to yeah, say. it's a great story, and 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 it is, and it has that same kind of primal evil that that almost unknowable alien evil uh, in the vampires there. So that was kind of what I was trying to capture in Empire. And there's that there's actually a homage to Salem's Lot in Empire. The scene where uh frere ruffer's faith kind of fails him and the light fades in the wheel that he's holding up that's a shout out to father callahan when his faith is tested by barlow so yeah giving a little shout out to to the man himself okay that's great see I, that was my next question was was salem's lot an influence at all because uh I, I said that uh that you know big daddy boss really got me a lot of barlow vibes in that one chapter that i, that I talked about in my review I, I oh that. right yeah so yeah i mean I was going for that alien, that, that alien mindset, like the unknowableness of them, like a thing that is so old, it, it seems like it's from another world. It simply doesn't perceive reality the same way you do because its perceptions have been warped by hundreds and hundreds of years. Like it's difficult as a writer to put yourself into that mindset, but you know, it, it goes back to what I was saying before you kill a person every night for 700 years you don't see it as a person anymore you see it as food you view it with the same dispassion that you or i view the steak that we're about to eat like we don't think about the cow we don't worry that the cow had a family or other cows that missed it it's just a meal so i was trying to evoke that same sense of alien menace uh in in fabian in particular because he's so old um you almost become another species so yeah that that was the kind of vibe that i was going for so I got a lot of interview and uh, vampires of stat out of this. I I, I can't imagine oh, yeah. more influenced by Anne Rice, right? I mean, you know, oh yeah, shout out to Anne. Like we lo we lost her last week, yeah. which is so mad, so sad, man. Um, yeah, interview was a, one of the formative works of fiction for me, and and I think formative as a person as well. Like I read it when I was kind of eighteen, nineteen, and kind of getting into the goth scene and and kind of figure out who the hell I was. You know, you're in that stage where you're, you're not a kid anymore, but you're not quite an adult. Empire was one of the pathways into finding the people that I, that I thought of as friends for the next, you know, kind of 10 years of my life. Um, so yeah, it, it was, it was huge, both as an inspiration, but also, you know, just who I was as a person figuring out how the hell this all worked. Unless that's one of the coolest vampires in fiction ever. I also think Claudia is incredible. Like, yeah. She's so underrated as a character, man. Like everyone, I ask everyone who their favorite vampire from that series is. Everyone says the stat. Claudia is the catalyst. Like she makes that whole book come alive. I read it again recently because I was, when I was putting together Empire, I had three, three works really that I studied the craft of in terms of the framing device. Um, so there was Name of the Wind, there was Blood Song by Anthony Ryan, and there was Interview. And Interview was the one that, I cleave to most because the interview is kind of an ongoing conversation between Louis and the guy interviewing him. Whereas something like name of the wind, the interviewer, the chronicler, I think he's called in name of the wind. He doesn't really intercede. There's, there are a few chapters where Quoth will sit down and say, okay, now we have lunch and he'll have a chat with the chronicler, but the chronicler isn't a presence throughout the narrative. Whereas the, I, I think it's Daniel, David, 
who's interviewing Louis, he kind of interjects with questions and they have conversations throughout the book. So that was the craft of that was something that I sat down and studied pretty intensely before I got into Empire. And like Claudia's arrival is the thing that that changes that entire book. Like mm -hmm. she's the catalyst that sets fire to everything. She's made, she's she's the chaos that that propels the narrative forward. The book couldn't work without her. So yeah, she, she's probably my fave at all. I think it's because she's just, you know, it's such a long series and she's just there, you know, for five minutes. For, yeah. Aspect. Yeah. 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 Very, very good. There for, a, for a good time, not a long time. Yeah. 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 So I opened this up to viewer questions. I obviously wanted to ask my Stephen King and Anne Rice ones first, but uh, so and I got a lot, a lot of questions here. So uh, we're That's just going to roll with them. That's great. Now, first, I'm going to just do like the generic frequently asked questions because a lot of these are repeats and stuff. And the ones that I'm sure you've gotten asked a billion times. So uh, they That's should okay. be difficult for you. Uh, the big yeah. one, obviously, who are your favorite authors ever and what books left an impression on you in your youth? Uh, I mean, the gateway drug was The Hobbit. That's kind of a twee and cliche answer, but that was the first Mine fantasy too. book that I ever read. Um, that was the first time I felt like I was in a different place. Like I still remember the feeling of opening up those pages and seeing that map of Middle Earth and realizing I wasn't in Kansas anymore. Um, that, was, that was like a magic spell almost. And I still get that feeling today when I open up the front of a fantasy book and see a map. It's like transportive. It's It's the signal that you are going somewhere new. And then Hobbit was the first book that gave me that feeling. So it's kind of, it's cool to hack on Tolkien now almost. Um, but yeah, he was the gateway drug that led me into reading and now writing what I do for a living. So without those books, who knows where I'd be. Um, yeah, yeah Stephen like King. The answer, but it's, 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 <laughs> what else can you say I mean, really? You know, it's a, it's a cliche for a reason, man. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he, he's the great granddaddy of all of this stuff. And it's it certainly moved on since he was writing. And that's great. Like things should evolve. Things should be different. But there needs to be, you know, the, the first person through the wall. And he was he was the guy. So, yeah, um, Hobbit was probably the gateway to everything. I mean, Stephen King was a massive one. I was reading him from the time I was 10. Uh, I turned out OK for what, for what yeah, I was worth. reading way too young, too. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, Weirdly enough, the the Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman Dragonlance books, like I love them. I, I probably yeah, read a them a million times them. as a kid. Um, I don't. I had a friend read them, reread them recently, and he says they don't hold up. So I, I've kind of left them on the shelf. I haven't gone back and visited them, but they they hold a special place in my heart. Um, Robin Hobb was another massive one. Farsi trilogy and the Life Ship Traders were, yeah, they're still some of my favorite books of all time. Um, in terms of horror, yeah, St Stephen King would probably be the, the granddaddy of them all. Um, yeah. So, yeah, the, the, there's a, I went a lot of different ways. I, I kind of I branched from fantasy pretty quickly and I fell into sci-fi uh, and read a bunch of sci-fi. I, I didn't come back to really reading fantasy until I was kind of 17 or 18. So I fell down a, a horror sci-fi path initially. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, weirdly enough, fantasy is still my favorite of all time. Yeah, I kind of fell out of it for a little bit, and then I got in a wheel of time, and that kind of brought me back to being like, oh, yeah, I remember why I love this genre now. Yeah, uh, right. What do, you, what do you think of the show? Does the show I, hold I'm up? liking it, and I'm it. getting like a lot of crap from people for liking it, because I, I don't know. Okay. I guess book fans are really, really upset about it. But I mean, me and a, a partner that I have that do like after shows for it, we're just getting like just dragged in the comments because we're pretty positive on it. And I'm like, I, mean, I guess I just expect it to be a lot worse. So I don't know. I don't know. Right. Okay. So are, are people upset that it's not cleaving to the books as pure? Basically, as if any, any right. minor change from the book and I don't, why there's some that I'm like, hmm, that's a questionable decision, but you know, again, okay. I expected so much worse. So, you know, hmm. yeah, right. I mean, it looks amazing. I haven't, I haven't seen it at all, but the visions I've seen look pretty stunning. So yeah, it'll be interesting. This person, it's, it's always to... hard. Sorry. I'm oh, sorry. I, I was just going to say, it's always hard when you're adapting something like yeah. Yeah, I always try to look at these things from a showrunner perspective, and they got to get yeah. more than just the readers. They got to get casual audiences into it too. So, uh, sure, and, a little you know, on it's, it's such an expansive work. Um, you have to you have to cut some of it out. You know, it's fifteen books long, mm -hmm. um, unless you unless you have a company with with incredibly deep pockets and extraordinary faith in your abilities. They're probably not going to green light fifteen seasons probably from not. the get go. So, probably not. not as yeah. expensive as it as it looks like it is. Uh, this person would love to know what your favorite book of all time is. Where the wild things are. 
by Maurice Sendak. I've got a I've got a tattoo on my arm of Young Max. Yeah, um, yeah. It's I mean it, it's a it's a beautiful work in and of itself, but it's also a very valuable exploration in the futility of undirected anger. Um, it's about you know I I was a very angry young man when I when I learned to channel that anger into positivity and and use that energy to create something. But you know undirected rage is is pretty destructive. So where the wild things are is an excellent exploration in that theme in like a 16 page children book. That's great. I've never gotten an answer like this. This is great. I love it. What do you usually get? Oh, everybody, <laughs> the, the, the I don't know. Just something that everybody's read a million times. I get a lot sure. of the wind. I get a lot of, you know, Lord of the Rings. Um, a lot yeah. Of, right. You the, know, mo- the movie, this, the Spike Jones movie is also great. Like they, they took what is a very thin children's book and kind of extrapolate it on that theme. And they did a beautiful job of it. So, yeah. Definitely. I'm jumping ahead of myself here, but uh, is, is your love for tattoos, did that play into your decisions with the Silver Saints and, and, and Empire? Um, a little bit. I mean, I'm a very visually minded author. Uh, like I studied art. Uh, I was a graphic designer by trade before I got into writing. So when I, when I write, I see, I kind of see the film playing out in my head and I write what I see. So when I'm creating characters in my head, I always start from kind of a visual cue, a visual standpoint. And one of the initial visual cues I had of Gabe was kind of his skin glowing. Um, I didn't know why when I, when I first had that vision, but that was the vision I had in my head. So I kind of worked back and made it fit. Um, I mean, it's, it's partly because I like them. It's partly because they look cool. Uh, it was partly because I thought it was a cool idea. I mean, the, the, the passages where I'm talking about him getting tattooed, that definitely plays into my experiences. Like it's not, it's not fun. <laughs> um, yeah. You kind of learn to see through time. It, it's, it's a very weird thing to subject yourself to. Um, so yeah, the, the experience of getting them plays into the text, but you know, my, my love of them and love of the art form. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess it, it, it partially influences the visual stylings of the novel too. Yeah. I've always been fascinated with tattoos, but too scared to get one because I'm like, well, my favorites change so much. I was like, besides, unless I got like something that was like Tolkien or the dark tower or something, I can't think of anything I'd ever get where I'd be like, I regret, I that, get, you know, so. I get one for every book every book series that I publish. So all of my tats are my other books. So that's, that's kind of never night. And there's an empire one up the inside of my arm. And nice. that's my illuminate tattoo. That's my lifelike tattoo. So yeah, right. I get, I get one for every series that I publish. I got one for my 10th wedding anniversary as well. So when you run out of real estate, are you going to retire? <laughs> yeah, maybe. I mean, there's a lot, I've only got my arms done. So um, I, there's still a lot of real estate to go. This person says, do you consider yourself a grimdark author, author because your work is very grimdark, at least for me, and please tell him that he has a black heart. Ha, thanks. Uh, I, don't, I mean, I don't know what grimdark is. I, I don't understand no how you define that as a term. Um, I certainly deal with dark themes. I deal with morally gray characters uh, and ambiguous morality. I I find that kind of story far more interesting to write and those characters far more interesting to spend time in the heads of. Um, I like the idea that the worlds I build are dangerous and the characters are in constant peril and sometimes they just fucking die because that's the way real life is. Um, so if that qualifies me as grimdark, then sure. But I, I mean, I don't, I don't like to apply too many labels to work because it's a shortcut to, labels are a shortcut to conversation, but they're also, they can lead people to decide whether they like or dislike the book before they even try it. It kind of goes back to what we were saying before, you know, you say vampire diaries is paranormal teenage romance. You can just say, well, I don't like that. So I'll never try it. Um, so yeah, but if, if that criteria, which, which seems to be the case, um, kind of dark, morally ambiguous, very dangerous worlds, uh, is what constitutes grimdark, then, then sure. That's probably a good as way to describe my work as any. So to me, is it like Joe Abercrombie? Then it's grimdark. That's why you're just saying. And, and I'm just going to say, your body count in this one, I think it probably qualifies. Oh, <laughs> if I might, by yeah. my definition. <laughs> sure, sure. I mean, if that if that's one of the qualifiers, then yeah, high body count. Empire certainly has that. I, I, I did a count the other day. There 
I think there's, uh, I, w- I won't get into spoilers, but yeah, yeah, it's a dangerous world and it should I, be. I what mean, I said is you the, guys, no one can accuse him of being soft on his characters. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so. Right. I mean, that, that was kind of my intent. Like I, I wanted to paint a world on the edge of collapse. Like mm. uh, we're right up at the edge of the precipice and if we stay there too much longer, we're going to fall off. I wanted it to feel like anyone could go at any moment because, you know, that was the kind of world that I built. You know, humans are almost an endangered species in the world that I've built. So you can't build an environment like that without breaking a few eggs, <laughs> without losing a few characters. So what made you become a writer? Was it a novel or just something else? I was a writer for a living. I used to work in advertising agencies. Oh. So I wrote television commercials for a living. Um, but the problem is working in advertising is your work isn't yours. You're, you're, you're the servant of many masters uh, and there's a lot of ways your ideas can get shot down. Like you, you will, you might write the best script that you've ever written in your life and it'll get shot down by a client or it'll get shot down in market research or it'll get shot down by some internal stakeholder. The odds of your work getting through unscathed and making it up on the screen is millions to one. That's why there's so few good ads on TV. <laughs> so I started working on a story in my free time just to have something that was mine. I didn't even know that it was going to be a book. It was just something that I could write that I had control over. And if it sucked, it sucked because I sucked. And if it was good, it was good because I was good. I couldn't blame it on anybody else. I couldn't say, oh, the client fucked it up. Um, And that, you know, I started out with a chapter and that chapter became an act and that act became a book over 18 months. Like I say, I didn't know what it was going to be a book. I didn't plan it. I didn't tell anybody that I was doing it. My wife didn't even know what I was doing until I was almost finished because I didn't know if I was going to finish. I thought it might be something that I would just kind of tail off from, but I really enjoyed the ritual of going there every day. Um, And it, yeah, like I say, it felt like it was some place that was mine. That, that book sucked because books that you don't plan and just start writing uh, without knowing if you're going to finish them generally tend to suck. And it was the first book that I wrote. First books that you write tend to suck, but it made me fall in love with the process. And so when I finished that first book, I approached the next book in a far more, I, I planned it. I did my homework and studied, you know, the path by which you could be traditionally published and wrote with that aim in mind and that, was the first that ended up being the first book that got me representation and got me published although weirdly enough that first book i wrote that sucked it was a vampire book this is back in like 2008 or something and one of the world building ideas in that book made it into empire so you know that it wasn't it wasn't wasted effort <laughs> oh, so that's my next that question was, it, was has this been published but uh yeah i guess not no it's terrible it's <laughs> I mean, my, most first books tend to be bad. If you hit it out of the park on the first try, then you're, right. you're pretty damn talented. So, yeah, I, I, it's not a good book, but the idea that vampires can't choose who they turn, like that the process of random, and that sometimes people turn after they've decomposed and they, they wake up in those decomposed bodies with those decomposed brains was one of the ideas in that first psyche book, and that made it into Empire. So, yeah, it lives on in another form. No, no work is wasted. No words are wasted. That's one of the things I tell people. I never throw anything away. Sure. Even if something you're writing makes it onto the doesn't make it into the final book, it hits the cutting room floor. It may it may have some kind of influence somewhere else in the text or somewhere else in the narrative. So yeah, no work is wasted. Or you never know. I mean, look at The Long Walk by Stephen King, one of my favorite books by him. And it's one that he just kind of wrote as a teenager and just didn't put in a drawer for years until he was a more successful. Yeah, author. sure. Wow, he I mean, was the, like 17. Yeah. There's that great story. Uh, in on writing where he wrote the opening chapter for Carrie and threw it in the bin, in the garbage, yeah. threw it in the wastebasket. And his wife came in, cleaned up his office afterwards and took it out of the trash basket and read it and straightened it out and said, this is actually, you might be onto something here. This is really good. And that was the book that started everything. We have tab yeah. for the thing for all that, right? Now I know yeah, you get this one a lot. Away. Uh, Cause I got this question like five times in this and I, I can't wait for this. Cause I know what you can say. Has anyone ever told you that you look like 2005 Dave Grohl from Foo Fighters? Uh, yeah, I get that a lot. <laughs> I get it at every gig that I go to like ever, <laughs> um, which is weird. Like what is Dave Grohl doing at a, some weird metal show down in Melbourne? But uh, 
yeah, pretty much every gig that I go to. And sometimes on the street. I had the first time I was getting an author photo done. Uh, I had a buddy of mine with me and we went to this alleyway. It's called ACDC Lane uh, in oh. Melbourne. It's named after the band, obviously. Sure. There's this bar there called the Cherry Bar. It's this rock and roll bar. And we were, ta- we were taking photos in the alleyway because the walls are covered in graffiti and band posters and stuff. And this guy walks up from Cherry Bar with a, like an armload of empties he's cleaning up from the night before. And he looks at me and he sees me and he sees a guy with a camera. Um, and a little unknown, unbeknownst to us, there was Foo Fighters posters on the wall mm. behind us. Like they were touring that year or something. And he kind of did, I saw him do this double take. And then he walked straight into the bin and like dropped all his <laughs> empties. It's a massive smash of glass. Uh, and I, I had to disappoint him and tell him it, it wasn't me. But yeah, no, I, I, I get a lot. I get a lot. It's not a bad thing. I mean, yeah. there could be worse people that you get compared to. Right. Like I think uh, that, again, a Stephen King story we was talking about that someone thought he was Francis Ford Coppola. And at the time, no one knew who he actually was. He was like, yes, I am. Right. I am Francis Ford Coppola. Yeah, sure. I mean, you might get a free drink out of it or something. <laughs> Uh, this person wants to know if you take any inspiration from video games or anime, such as Castlevania and Dark Souls. I love Souls, yeah. Um, and Bloodborne was one of the aesthetics that I briefed Bonnie on. So Bon is my illustrator. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's Her name is Mona Lime Online. She's this incredible illustrator. And so for those of you who don't know, Empire is illustrated, has an illustrated component. They're very good, yes. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, and she, weirdly enough, she's a Melbourne girl. I had no idea she was from Melbourne when I hired her for the job, but it turns out she lives like 20 minutes down the road from me. Huh? So when I was first briefing her on the gig, I sent her a bunch of like visual inspiration, just kind of where my head was at when I was describing these things in text um, and said, this is kind of a starting point, and then you apply your own aesthetic to it and go for it. Um, so yeah, the, the aesthetic of the Souls world and the Bloodborne worlds are a big part in the visuals that play out in my head. Because like I say, I, I kind of see a film playing in my head when I'm writing and I transcribe the film down on the paper. So the, the aesthetic of those worlds, yeah, it, it pretty much perfectly matches Empire. So yeah, the, the Souls game and Bloodborne are a huge part of it. Uh, Castlevania, no, I hadn't, I hadn't actually watched that until kind of earlier this year. And I've never played the video game. Like I was a Sega boy. I wasn't a Nintendo <laughs> boy. So I, I never played any of the video games, but yeah. Uh, the, uh, the Castlevania series is actually really good. And I, a lot of people, I've, I've told them when I was trying to sell them on this book, I was like, if you guys like Castlevania on Netflix, I think you'll like this quite a bit. So I Yeah, really cool. Yeah. Sure. So which is most like your writing setup? A fancy desk and a computer, a laptop and pajamas in bed, or loud rock music and a glass of whiskey? I, mean, I, I can't listen. I listen to music, but I can't listen to anything with lyrics because yeah. the words get in the way of my words. Yeah. So I, I, I tend to listen to either movie scores or just kind of ambient music. There's a, there's a great studio called Cryo Chamber that have a bunch of music up online on YouTube. And it's kind of just this dark, gothy, ambient flow. I kind of, I write to that a lot. Um, I used to be able to write wherever. I used to write out on the couch um, with a laptop, but uh my wife got annoyed at me taking up the entire house basically so i'm uh-huh. i'm exiled to my study now uh and i just have a big setup i've got it in front of me right now there's a couple of big monitors um i have three monitors running one for one for manuscripts one for manuscript plan and one for research if i'm going and checking something or looking up a word or whatever um so yeah things have got a little more elaborate over the years but i used to be able to write anywhere i'd take a laptop and i could write on the bus i could write on the train i used to write on the way to work on the train when I first, when I was still working a day job, I used to bring my laptop to work and book a meeting room at my lunch break and just go in there and smash out like a thousand words on my lunch break. So I, I could write anywhere, but I've kind of lost that ability over time. Yeah, it makes me think of when my wife comes home and tries to take a nap in the living room and is upset that no, everyone isn't completely quiet in the whole house while she's trying. Oh, to that was me. Room. Yeah, I would, I would sit in the middle of the house and my wife would like be like quiet walk past yeah. me. Yeah, and I'd, I'd be furious. <laughs> Yeah. So if you could give yourself, your younger self, one piece of advice, what would it be? That depends how young. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Like, I like where I am. I have a pretty amazing life. So I think it would be pretty arrogant to me to lecture to my young self because I've ended up in an amazing place. I get to do this incredible thing for a living that I never imagined I'd be able to make a living from. 
Um, avoid blondes. <laughs> avoid, <laughs> avoid blondes. Let's go with that. <laughs> um, and this, I, I actually think this has actually been answered because I saw your blurb on the front of his upcoming book. This person wants to know if you've read John Gwynn. Oh man, I fucking love John. Yeah, yeah he's, he's awesome, amazing. ain't he? Shadow, Shadow of the Gods is probably my favorite book that I read this year. Yeah, um, yeah he he's. I think he's an incredibly well. I, I don't think he's underrated. I think he's actually getting the credit he deserves. Finally, now. yeah. I, mm-hmm. I'm seeing his name around a lot more, which is great. Um, yeah, I think he's an incredibly talented guy, an incredibly lovely guy as well. Yeah, he's um, one yeah, of the nicest guys I've talked to ever. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to the new one. The covers are amazing as well. Yeah, aren't they? I just yeah. saw the new cover. Yeah, it's sick. Uh, but his previous series is also well worth checking out. I Faith think the Fallen is one of my favorite fantasy series. I love That's it. It's great. Ma- Malice is a killer book, man. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, if if you're in the mood for, I mean, it's five books, which isn't huge in terms of the wheel of time scope of things. Yeah. It's still a pretty big commitment, but like the book, the series is finished, and it's killer. So yeah, John John is an amazing dude and an amazing writer. So it's yeah, good I to think see it's a, it's, it's hard for me to say another author that has eight books. And he's eight for eight for me, you know, and John Gwynn is, he's just right. that good. He's just exactly yeah. what I want out of a fantasy author right now, I think. Yeah, he's amazing. And just a terribly nice dude as well. So yeah, it's cool. So do you have a mentor or a confidant that you sound off to for ideas or maybe go to for advice? I have a group of crit partners um, hmm. who read my stuff. I have, I have one really close writing buddy uh, who we kind of kick ideas out on each other all the time. Um, we lived together for a month in Prague when I was working on Empire and she, her name's C.S. Picat. She's, uh, she brought out a book recently called Dark Rise. She's a YA author. Well, I mean, she, she used to write um, fantasy romance, but now she's in YA. And she's just an incredibly talented person in terms of, in terms of plan and structure and scope. Like she's, she's, she's just a genius. So yeah, she's, she's kind of my go-to gal for, kicking ideas around but i have yeah i have like five crit partners that read all my stuff um strangely all of them are ladies all of them are women but between them all they're they're kind of good at different things and good at spotting different things uh so between and all incredibly well read as well so between that gamut um they they tend to spot any any chinks in the armor any flaws in the book um, but yeah, in terms of in terms of bouncing ideas, Kat and I kind of kick ideas around all the time. We get together every Thursday and write in a cafe together, write with another another Melbourne author, a guy named Tom Taylor, who writes for Marvel and DC. Uh, he's doing the current run of Nightwing and Superman and stuff. So we just sit in a cafe and shoot the breeze, and then then write for hours at a stretch. So yeah, we we kind of have a brains trust going there, like a writers' club. It's pretty cool. I like that. Kinda, yeah. It's weird. Like we sit at a table and and talk about anything other than writing we're all massive formula one fans so we've been talking about formula one for weeks and then we just sit and ignore each other for five or six right. hours in a stretch <laughs> but we're all sitting together so somehow it's a communal activity oh every time i go out with a group of people they all just look at their phones anyway so that ain't nothing just sitting there writing and not talking to each other yeah sure sure at least we're doing something productive right if you could have a writing collaboration with any living author who would it be oh man that's a hard question yeah. I mean, you, you would want to write with someone that you revered, but the danger would be you'd be eclipsed. Like <laughs> if you wrote a book with Stephen King, everyone would just assume that Stephen King. His name would be real big and yours would be. <laughs> yeah, it'd <yeah. laughs> yeah, yeah. be on the back. You flip it over. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I would love to work with someone that I admired, you know, like a, like a Neil Gaiman or someone like that. But again, you'd, you'd probably be eclipsed. So I, I would probably rather work with someone who's kind of a peer whose work I admire. L- Lainey Taylor would be up there. Lainey Taylor is one of my favorite fantasy authors of all time. Like she, her prose is probably the best that I've read. Like I, I it's, it's a weird thing. You become an author and you lose the ability to look at work at, at, books as a reader anymore you're always kind of critiquing you're always studying you can't just relax and enjoy um laney's prose is so good that i kind of find myself falling into it as if by magic like she does stuff that i that i see no one else doing um and i kind of have to force myself to study the craft of it because what she does is so clever uh but i know 
her her way of working is very different to mine. So I, I don't know if we would ever work well together. I've done. I've, I've done. Remember, does she have a series that we would know out here in the states? Maybe. Yeah, man. She did. Uh, she did a YA series called Daughter of Smoke and Bone, but her new series, the first one, is called Strange the Dreamer. It's kind of crossover. It's kind of crossover YA adult. Um, but it's beautiful. Like her prose is incredible. It's like reading poetry. Um, and she can spend a page and a half describing something as simple as like a kiss. And it's like a fucking magic spell. Like it's incredible. And her, and her world building is super weird as well. Like usually I can read a fantasy book and I can see the influence. I can see where people are taking bits and pieces from different influences. Her stuff is, it just comes out of her head and it's, it's strange. It's kind of, it's kind of a lighter version of new weird. I don't know if you ever read any China Mabel. Um, China Mabel is one of my favorite authors as well. It's, it's like a, it's like a more optimistic, brighter version of new weird. It, it's like just really cool out there ideas in terms of her structures and world building patterns that I don't see anywhere else. What you described um, kind of sounds like how I felt reading uh, Assassin's Apprentice by Robin Hobb the first time. Oh yeah. She's like amazing, man. Writing was just like, wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, she's, I mean, she was a formative writer for me. Um, and I was lucky enough to do an event with her just recently. Like, if you had told me when I was 19 that one day Robin Hobb would be blurbing your books and doing events yeah. with you, I would have told you that you were crazy. Um, yeah, so Lainey's great, man. You should check her out. Strange to Dreamer was the first one, and Muse of Nightmares was the second one. She did a duology. Um, yeah, they're beautiful books. The prose is extraordinary. All right. If you could write in any other author's universe, which one would it be? Man, I don't think I would. I don't think I could. The, the ones I love, I couldn't do as well as the people who make them. Um, and I'd be terrified of messing it up. <laughs> like, That's why I always I think default I, to Star Wars. I felt like I could do Star Wars and not, you know, hurt too many feelings. <laughs> so. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah. I mean, the, the, the thing about something like Star Wars is, I don't want to annoy anybody when I say this. I know there's a lot of Star Wars fans out there. Uh, I don't like Star Wars. I don't like oh, what Star Wars okay. has become. Um, I think there is a real danger when any culture looks with more fondness at the things that they have done than the things that they are going to do. Mm -hmm. And I think Star Wars is a nostalgia trip. I think the things people love in Star Wars are the things that they loved from 30, 40 years ago. Sure. Um, you know, I, I remember the internet blowing up when Luke came back at the final episode of The Mandalorian. Yeah. Like everyone's seeing Luke Skywalker with the green lightsaber in full Jedi mode. Like that's nostalgia. That's, yeah. that's an emotion that's 30 years old. And it's great that it makes people feel great, but I would, I am much more interested in finding the next Star Wars. Yeah. The thing that makes me feel like that, that is something completely new that hasn't been done before. I, I don't like going back to the well for those emotions. I like finding something new, something that makes me feel that way that I haven't seen. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to mess with, the properties that I love because the creators know them best. The creators can do them best, but also in like shared universes like Star Wars, I, I don't like the idea that these companies are spending hundreds of millions of dollars playing in this sandbox that we've been in for 30 years when they could be spending hundreds of millions of dollars developing something entirely new that we haven't seen before that's been my complaint about I, disney they got more money than god why are yeah. we just doing marvel and star wars over and over again agreed man new. like I, I would i would i would much rather watch a hundred jupiter ascendings which is a terrible film by any <laughs> by any measure at least went for it. something new <laughs> yeah it's something new man they tried something different and it failed and sure like that's the risk and when you're doing something new you don't have a roadmap you don't have a path to success. You don't have a built-in audience. You don't have a guarantee, which is why these companies go for the safe kick. They go for something that they know people are going to buy. They do Ghostbusters 3. They do a new Star Wars movie. They do another Marvel film because people will go and see them. Like Doing something original and doing something new requires courage and it requires an investment and entertaining the possibility of failing. But we have to dare to fail, man. Otherwise, we're just going to be chewing our cud for the next 30 years. Like, Absolutely agree. So, yeah, I, I, 
I would rather make something that's mine and I would rather that thing suck than, than do something that's been done before. I would, I would rather play in a, in a bad originals band than play in a covers band. That's just me. That's just no, me. it makes a lot of sense. What's the most surprising thing you learned about yourself writing your stories? Do you have a uh, heart, I guess, apparently. <laughs> well, I mean, I do like that. That's, that's the kind of the image that I maintain. I, I like what you I'm say actually, on your website. Uh, you do not believe in happy endings. I like that a lot. Sure. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that's actually true though. Like um, I, I think I do have an optimistic streak in me, even though, you know, it's that, it's that old saying, like you scratch a cynic and you'll find an idealist underneath. I think that's probably me. Um, so yeah, I, I think there probably is a streak of optimism in me that I don't, I'm not consciously aware of, but it kind of creeps through in my writing. Like even in a book as dark as Empire gets, there's still this kind of thread of hope and light that kind of weaves through the narrative. And I think we get to, you know, a kind of positive place in the end, even though we, we walk through hell to get there. So yeah, that, I, I may be more of an optimist than I give myself credit for. <laughs> or than others give you credit for apparently. So. Sure. <laughs> I mean, I, I do like that reputation. I, I do. I do like it when people reach those points in the book where the bad thing happens and they, they send me like an all caps tweet or a message on Instagram. I like, I like seeing weirdly enough pictures, readers send me pictures of themselves crying, uh, which is a strange thing to take joy from the fact that you've made someone cry. But at, at the same time, that's amazing. Like the, these are characters that live in my head. Like I wrote them sitting on my couch in my Ugg boots. So the fact that words on a page characters that came out of here can have so much resonance with a reader that it moves them to tears or that makes them angry or makes them laugh Mm -hmm. yeah man it's amazing it's 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 magical so even though it is a weird thing to to kind of to feel good about making someone upset i'm i'm just glad that people feel anything at all i'm glad that my work can move you in whatever way it does that's that's a really that's probably the coolest thing about what i do for a living I went to a Pierce Brown that writes Red Rising. I went to a book signing. Oh, yeah. us, and uh, I asked him to very do, handsome. Do you man. like it when you're when your viewers or your readers are upset or sad about you coming off a character? And he says, Yeah, I get power from those tears. <laughs> so, so yeah. I mean, you do, yeah. And in in a I mean there's there's a cool joy in the in the fact that you just made that you made people upset. Um, but yeah, there, there's also there's it's, it gives the work significance. It lets you know that it matters. These characters matter. Like I, people send me pictures of like, they, they get words that I wrote tattooed on their body for life. Like, and I, and I get, I've got some amazing letters over the years, man. I, I got a letter at the start of last year that made me cry. Like it was a handwritten letter from a lady in the UK who I had met at the Darkthorn launch the year before. And she was quite shy when she approached me. Uh, and so she wrote me a letter to kind of explain why. And she, man, she had had a hell of a life. Like I won't, I won't go into it, but she wrote to me to say thanks for the Nevernight books because they got her through a really dark mm. time in her life. Um, that's incredible. Like that, that's as close to magic as I can imagine. The idea that these characters that I wrote and these stories that came out of my head can mean so much to somebody that they will carve those words into their body forever or that it will get them through some of the darkest days of their lives and some of the darkest episodes that anyone has to go through. That that's incredible to me, um, which is, yeah, it, it's one of the best parts of my job. Got to imagine that's the best feeling as a writer. Here's one from an Australian. He said, I just want to not uh-huh. we don't have a question, but I just want to shout out how good it is to see an Australian fantasy author get some spotlight overseas in the States. We do not have many of them. No, there's not a lot of us. Um, it's hard, man. Like Australia is a, is a much smaller space. Uh, you know, we, we only had like 24 million people live in this whole country, which is like the population of New York state. So it's hard to make a living here as an artist, any kind of artist, musician, filmmaker, whatever. Um, but the wonderful thing about the internet is those barriers aren't as high as they used to be. Like you can communicate online pretty freely with an editor anywhere in the world. Um, it's, it's certainly easier now than it ever has been. So yeah, if, if you're an Aussie and you're thinking about trying to break in, then then don't let the tyranny of distance dissuade you. It's it's not an impediment. It's certainly not the impediment that it used to be. But yeah, it's cool. Like I, 
I love to see Aussies punching on the world stage as well. Like I was saying, Tom Taylor, my mate, like he's he's writing for Batman and Superman. He's writing the, the biggest comic book titles in the world. So Formula One driver Daniel Ricciardo, who drives from McLaren, he's a Perth boy. He grew up in the same hometown that I did. It's you know we're pretty rare, so it's cool to see Aussies succeeding globally in any endeavor. Yeah, besides besides uh, ACDC, I could I couldn't think of a uh, very much that I personally knew from Australia. So or maybe Crocodile. Oh, really? Dundee, the Crocodile yeah. Dundee movies, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> you're a, you're a metalhead, aren't you? You listen to metal music. Yeah. What about Parkway Drive? You haven't heard of Parkway Drive? Heard of them? Haven't heard of them. I'm metalhead, but I, I I still I got to the point by like 2010. I just kind of I turned into my parents. I'm like everything now sucks, you know. So no, no, I do, no, no. I do listen, have to go overseas to, Park, to find good metal to music. Parkway. Yeah. Listen to Parkway and listen to North Lane. They're they're a Sydney band. Okay. Uh, yeah, Parkway Drive, North Lane. Uh, who else? Alpha Wolf. They're a Melbourne band. There's great Australian metal music, man. Um, yeah, you should check. I'll send you a list. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll All right. I'll, I'll, I'll always listen to good because we got we have the metal scene in the states is terrible. It's terrible. That's why we still have bands. Oh, really? Like Megadeth and Metallica are the only ones who can like sell tickets over here. They have to go overseas because they get, you know, a hundred thousand people or they can come here and play for 1500, you know, just, just metal's dead in the States. It is really, I had no idea. I, I went Pantera to, was like the last hurrah out here for metal. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, there, there's a bunch, there are a bunch of big bands, but yeah, they tend to be UK. Like bring me the horizon of massive. They fill arenas right now. Um, and I feel like I'm the same with big. artists or I'm sorry with authors. It's like I, a ton of my favorite authors are in the UK. You know, so I was like, huh. they have a harder, they have an easier time making that leap across the pond than I think some other places do. I have, I have noticed there is a little bit of difference between, well, I mean, I'm generalizing here and generalizing is, is never generally a good idea, but there, there tends to be, a, there's a trend towards darker, more morally ambiguous Grim dark, I guess, stories coming out of places other than the states. The the fantasy in the states tends to trend more towards kind of heroic fantasy, I guess, mm. traditionally epic fantasy, um, which is fine. Like the, it's great. It, and there's obviously a, a bunch of people who like it, but yeah, it tends to be like it's it's the UK crew. It's Joe and John Gwynn and Mark Lawrence, all those dudes, me, I guess, who are playing in the mud, I guess. Um, which is interesting. I don't, I don't know why that is. Um, I haven't spent enough time in the States, but yeah, it, it's an interesting trend that I've noticed. American authors tend to be more, yeah, heroic fantasy, I guess, is a good way to describe it. That's a good way of putting it. Uh, this person would love to know how you pursued getting published. Get a ton of rejection um, letters or anything like that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I went kind of the trad pub route, so it's, it's a pretty boring story. I wrote a terrible book. Um, which is that first vampire book. I was lucky enough to send it to a couple of literary agents who encouraged me in terms of the prose that I had written. Like the book was broken, but the way I wrote, they liked it. And so they encouraged me in that sense, which was lovely of them because agents don't have to do that. Agents are very busy people. Um, and yeah, I, I chalked it up to experience and wrote again, uh, wrote another book and sent it out did the whole query dance. It's a very boring story. I've got hundreds and hundreds of rejection letters. Um, weirdly enough, I sent the agent who ended up representing me. Um, I sent, he, he was Pat Rothfuss's agent, a guy named Matt Biala. I sent him an email submission, but I also sent him a physical submission. Uh, like this is, this is like 10 years ago, back when snail mail submissions got accepted. And weirdly enough, the email submission just got lost. And it wasn't until Matt's assistant, the amazing Lindsay, uh, who picked my envelope out of the slush pile and, and read it on her lunch break. That was that was kind of my big break. So uh, I don't know if that's a good lesson to, to be giving people send everything twice. But if I hadn't sent things twice, then I might not have been discovered. And yeah, that I kind of went from there. Um, so it's a grind, I guess. There's nothing romantic about it. There's there's no silver bullet. There's no magic trick. There's no inside baseball or secret handshake. I didn't know anyone. I didn't go to any conferences. I didn't go to any clarion courses or whatever. That you know, I'm not saying there's no value in doing that, but that was not the route that I chose. Um, it's pretty hard to do that from Australia anyway. It was just a grind. It was writing, writing every day, sitting down at the computer, sending out query letters, working on your letter sending out another bunch like yeah there's 
there's there's no magic to it it's it's just work um there's yeah there's no secret handshake there's there's no password there's no shortcut you just got to sit down and do the miles and if you're lucky you make it through i would imagine so, yeah. being able to take criticism is probably a big one because i know now I yeah. could say I could take those rejection letters in my twenties. That probably would have devastated me, and I'd have been like, "Well, it's time to go back to college." <laughs> yeah, know, so. I mean, I think I think part of that came from working in ads um, mm. because your work is just getting rejected. constantly rejected. Yeah. Like every day, you you will have you'll write a hundred ideas, and ninety nine of them will just get shot right in front of you. So you learn not you learn to get a pretty thick skin. And in a in when you're a creative in an advertising agency, you also work in a partnership. So you have two creatives in a room, you'll have an art director and a copywriter and you're bouncing ideas of each other all day, every day as well. So, and you if your partner's good, they will tell you when the ideas are bad. So yeah, you, you develop a thick skin, but yeah, re- rejection is part of the process. Um, and patience is part of the process as well. Our agents are typically pretty busy, so it can take a while for them to get back to you. Mm. One of the important things that I learned is while you're waiting for those replies on those query letters, don't just wait by the phone, like be working on your next book. Yeah. We work on the next thing. All right. So what are some of your favorite rock and metal bands? And do you take inspiration from that music? Yeah, I do all the time. Um, my favorite band at the moment is a band called Architects. They're out of UK. They're kind of a metalcore band. Uh, I've been following them for years. Uh, they're awesome. And you're going to have to send me a list of some of these. I never heard of some of these. I will, man. Yeah, Architects are great. Uh, and they they went through a kind of personal tragedy a few years ago. They lost their lead guitarist um, who is the twin brother of the drummer. And he was their principal songwriter. Like he wrote all the lyrics and all their riffs. He was like the engine of the band and he died of skin cancer at like 28 sucked. And everyone thought the band was done, but they came back with a new guitarist and brought out this new album after Tom died. And it's, and it's just killer. And I've kind of gone from strength to strength since then. So it's been this awesome thing to be a part of. Uh, yeah, so Architects are amazing. Like Bring Me the Horizon are awesome. Uh, there's a new band just come out, Lorna Shore. I'm wearing a t-shirt right now. They're, they're kind of a new heavy band out of, I think they're out of the US. Um, Parkway Drive, as far as Aussies go, I should give the Aussies a shout out. Parkway Drive, North Lane, Alpha Wolf, uh, Spirit Box, They Art Is Murder. Uh, yeah, Avenged Sevenfold. Have you ever heard of Avenged Sevenfold? Thank you. Thank you. Oh yeah, I love Avenged Sevenfold. They haven't brought out any music for a while, yeah, but yeah, Nightmare. Time. Nightmare is a masterpiece. Nightmare is in my top ten albums of all time. Um, yeah, that. I don't. I don't know if they're. I'm anxiously awaiting the new album. Let's put it that way. It's been. It's been a long while for them since the last album came out. So it'll be interesting to see where they go next. Uh, but yeah, I, I love Avenged. They're amazing. Um, yeah, Nightmare's a masterpiece. I had my first time I heard Back Country. I was like, what is this all about? Oh, yeah. Back, back, back Country wow. was like, I did a, I did a sound. Uh, I did like a, what would you call it? Like a soundtrack for Empire. I put it up on Spotify. There's a bunch of bunch of music that kind of inspired me. Um, and Back Country is on there. Nice. Lamb of God is another big one. Lamb of God are Americans. They're from Virginia. Um, yeah, they're probably my favorite like metal, metal band. Uh, they do incredible stuff. But yeah, I, I will I will send you some links to some new right. new music, man. If you're still listening, to, I love Pantera, but if you're still listening to Pantera in 2020, you've got to right. shape up. It's, it's sad. <laughs> I got to go back to that because we don't have you know ton going on out here anymore. But uh, so, what book yeah, of there's yours? Some, there's, there's some great bands. I'll hook you up. All right, what book of yours do you suggest for first time readers? We're looking at your whole bibliography, and you got to recommend one book to them. Does it just kind of depend on like what age they are or what they're into? Or yeah, I mean, it depends what you're into. Um, if you're a younger reader, then probably Illuminate. Um, I mean, I'm still super proud of that book. It, it's a weird book. It, we did things with that book that I haven't seen done very often. Um, and it's a completed trilogy, so you can kind of binge everything at once. If you're into epic fantasy, I mean, Empire is the best book that I've ever written. Empire is a book that I couldn't have written five years ago. So the thing is, it's the first in a trilogy. So if you're the kind of person who wants to binge everything, start with Nevernight. Um, I'm still super proud of Nevernight. Like Nevernight was a series that started pretty much in obscurity. Like no one really knew who I was when that series came out. Uh, and the first book dropped without a lot of fanfare at all. But it, you know, it just built up an incredible readership over a couple of years. Like 
a group of fans who were just super passionate about it. I got a bunch of incredible fan art. There was something about the main character, Mia. People just love to draw her. So you can find art all over Instagram, all over the internet. And yeah, just through sheer word of mouth and reader love, that series kind of built and built over the course of the three books. So by the time Dark Dawn came out, that book was like an international bestseller. And again, there was no fanfare from my publishers, like much love to my publishers. But yeah, th that book arrived without a splash, but it built up to something incredible because purely through reader word of mouth. So yeah, um, I'm, I'm super proud of that series and I, I really love the way it ended. So if you, if you need a complete fantasy series, then Nevernight is a really good start. If you just want a good fantasy book, then Empire is the best thing that I've done. I'm I think it was when it. Dark Dawn was about to come out was the first time I'd heard your name. And I was like, what? but this is like huge. Why have I not heard of this yet? And then I was like, yeah, awesome it, covers. <laughs> it, it was this really weird organic thing. Um, you know, most books in most series in terms of their trajectory, they, they kind of start up here and they just kind of drift down, you know, over the course of two or three releases, people will just taper off. It's just yeah. the natural progression. Um, but I, I remember I got an email from my US publisher when God's Grave, the second book, came down. He's like, man, something weird is happening here. Yeah, like we don't see these. Yeah, you're selling more and more every single week. And this never happens. So, you know, congratulations, because this is what you want to happen. But it, it never does. Uh, and again, it, it was just this incredible fan community that kind of built up around it. You know, a bunch of incredible book bloggers and, and fan artists in particular. They just built this thing out of nothing. And I was lucky enough to kind of sit on the sidelines and, and watch it all happen. Like I had this amazing experience. Like I went over to Venice in 2018 to write Dark Dawn because the, the world in Nebonite is, it's vaguely inspired by kind of Merchant Prince Venice and ancient Rome. Uh, and so I went to live in Venice for a month to kind of immerse myself in the book and kind of surround myself in the architecture and stuff. And I did a meet and greet there with a couple of fans. Like I was just Instagramming that I was in Venice and a couple of fans said, Hey, you know, we're Italians. We'd love to come and meet you. And so on the last day I was in Venice, I had a meet and greet in this little cafe, like 25 people showed up or something. Um, and I, I asked them, you know, how the hell do you guys even know about me? Cause the, none of the books were published in Italy at this time. Uh, and I, you know, I got a chance to actually sit down and have a chat with them. And they had found out about the series through a couple of Australian book bloggers. Mm. But weirdly enough, one of the people at that meet and greet, a girl named Sarah, she was like an Italian book blogger. She's like a nexus for the fantasy community. So she kind of met me and we had a chat and she went back and told all her friends and they told all their friends and they told all their friends. So I came back like 18 months later when Dark Dawn dropped. And did these shows in Italy that were the biggest shows I had ever seen, like wow. hundreds and hundreds, like people out the door and around the block to meet me. I, I had my wife go out there and take photos of it because it was so trippy. I sent it to my dad and like, these people have been lined up since eight o'clock in the morning to see me. He's like, what for you? What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Who else is there? <laughs> yeah, for real. Is Dave Grohl there? Um, yeah, it, it, it was just this weird organic thing that spread purely through reader word of mouth. It was just amazing to watch, amazing to be part of. Uh, and I feel incredibly blessed to have readers like that. Like every author says it, but man, I have the best readers in the world. Like they go to the wall for me um, and they and they don't just talk about the book that they love. They sing about it. Like they, they paint about it. So yeah, it's in, it's incredible. So yeah, that was a really long-winded answer, but I'm, I'm very proud of Nevernight. So if you're into fantasy, yeah, that, that's a good series that is finished and a good place to start. Yeah, I'm starting a Tad Williams uh, memory server and thorn in January. But after I finish that first book, oh, yeah. I've one a month, then I'm then I'm going to be doing these. So I'm excited. Yeah, sure. I'm excited. Well, I hope you like them. They're weird, but I hope you like them. I like I weird. They got, uh, they, got, they got footnotes in them. Footnotes. I, yes, I've heard about the footnotes. I was like, <laughs> make sure that you read it physical, not on your digital, because it gets kind of weird on reading it digital. So I was like, okay. yeah, the footnotes are apparently hard to track on. Hey, I love Michael Crichton, and he had footnotes in all of his books. Sure. Okay, so sure. that's I'm, I'm a fan of Terry Pratchett as well. He did the footnote thing. So. I don't know if this person means uh, movies and TV or if they mean books. So just however you want to go with it. I'd love to know what his favorite sci-fi franchise is. Uh, I mean, probably Star Trek. Mm -hmm. But again, that's the nostalgia bug talking. Like there hasn't been good new Star Trek in a little while. It's been um, since Deep I Space love, Nine for me, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I love Next Gen. Um, yeah. I like Deep Space Nine. So Babylon 5 was another huge one oh, when I was growing so up. Much, I loved yes. B5. Um, 
And it's really interesting, again, the nostalgia bug, like they're apparently remaking that with new budget and J. I mean, Michael that's how J. Michael Straczynski, so I want to give it a chance, but I'm like, sure, all those agreed. actors are passed on now, you know, so it's like, I don't know. Yeah, man, I, I think there's a real danger in going back to the well. It's like, it's why I didn't reread the Dragonlance books. Like, they're in this place in my head that's sacred and I don't want to fuck with it because going back just ruins it. Um, yeah, so, I mean, as far as new sci-fi goes, I love The Expanse. I think that's yeah, Who doesn't? Cool. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, there is an amazing show on net i guess you would kind of call it fantasy sci-fi there's an amazing show on netflix that just dropped called arcane i've which had is, so many recommendations for it yes weirdly enough it's an animated series for a moba video game called league of legends yeah. they've just kind of taken the world and a couple of characters and they've built something extraordinary like really? it's it's beautiful it's the most stunning animation i've ever seen in my life like I'm a big Spider-Man fan. I love Into the Spider-Verse. The animation for Arcane is on par with Into the Spider-Verse. Mm-hmm. And it's a it's a great story, man. Like, given that it's come from a video game, right. they, they tend to be pretty bad adaptations. But, I mean, League of Legends is a MOBA, so the lore is quite thin, and they've just extrapolated on it. They've built a really great story. It's beautiful. Um, and I, I guess you would kind of call that sci-fi. It's kind of steampunk fantasy-ish. So, yeah, check out Arcane. It's great. All right, that, now we got that's some... what I'm talking about. Like, you know, people doing something new. Mm-hmm. Like, yes, seen yes. That shit before. Yeah. And that's why I say you're making me choose one. I'm going to choose to keep Netflix out of all these streaming services because at least they see, keep trying new things. They keep trying new. Yeah, series. they do. That's they the don't always thing. land, but at least they're trying. That's exactly right. They they are prepared to fail, and they understand that failure is a necessary part of the process. Like, you you shoot a hundred times at the target, you're going to hit the bullseye, and when you hit the bullseye, you hit big. So. Those other 99 shots that miss are probably worth it in the end. And you yeah, wind up with something me. like Arcane, which is just for, incredible. For every Arcane or Stranger Things they have, they have a Cowboy Bebop, you know? But at least they're trying. Sure. At least they're trying. That's right. You know, so. Yeah, you got to dare to fail. I got some series-specific questions now. So finally, uh, here's okay. one for uh, Illuminae and... Uh, is it Illuminae? Am I saying that right? Illuminae. Illuminae, 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 Illuminae and yeah. Aurora Cycle. Uh, sure. What parts of Illuminae did you contribute to and... Uh, I'm sorry. Let me start over. What parts of Illuminate did he contribute? Did him and Amy write certain sections, certain characters? How did they come up with a constructive, cohesive story? Yeah. So I in Illuminate, I wrote I wrote Aiden, uh, which is the insane supercomputer. Uh, I wrote the boy protagonist, so Ezra, Nick, and Reese. And I also wrote Ella, who is Nick's computer hacker cousin she's probably my favorite character in the series uh in terms of how we built the series together we basically co-authoring is kind of weird like um we have learned that if you plot too far in advance with a co-author either one or two of you will think of a cooler idea that kind of breaks the plot so we've learned over time you only plot about 100 pages in advance and the way we do that is we get together at the pub uh, I will drink and Amy watches me drink. And after about drink three, that's when the magic starts to happen. And we right. will just kind of, it's kind of like what I described before when I worked in advertising, we would just bounce ideas off each other all day in terms of where the plot could go and what twists we could put in. Uh, and then we will take that hundred pages that we plotted, break it down into POVs. So in Aurora, for example, there are six main characters. I drive three, Amy drives the other three we'll figure out what POV is the most appropriate to impart the information or the emotion that we're trying to. And then we will go away and kind of write our individual parts and send them to each other. So it's a little bit like, you know, that story, the shoemaker and the elves, where the shoemaker leaves leather out overnight on his bench and he wakes up in the morning and the elves have kind of made shoes. Mm. Being a co-author is kind of like that. Like you go to bed and you wake up in the morning and there's more book in your inbox that you didn't write. Too bad it doesn't uh, work like that all the time, right? That'd be nice. Uh, I mean, it's, it. <laughs> yeah, so, sometimes, sometimes. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, yeah it, it's it's just a collaborative process. We kind of bounce ideas off each other all day. None of it, Neither one of us is particularly egotistical. Like we've learned to accept criticism and we're both trying to make the best book that we can. So yeah, eventually we will find the path forward and, and take it. Um, so yeah, I, I wrote the boys and Ella and Aiden in Illumine. Uh, in Aurora, I wrote Scarlet, Cal, Tyler, Sadie, and Cat. Yeah. 
if you haven't read the books, they won't mean it. Not, not yet, but I, that's, <laughs> I just wait to see if you can remember them all. I, sometimes I can't get my kids' names right. Uh, are, you yeah, right. <laughs> and, are you and Amy planning any more sci-fi space opera collaborations in the in the future? They capitalize that part. So, I mean, I guess they want you to write sci-fi together. Yeah, nothing nothing planned at this stage. Amy has a new series starting in 23, which is a YA fantasy series. Uh, and I'm pretty firmly entrenched in adult now. Um, I like writing adult fantasy. That's That's kind of my jam at the moment. And the Empire books are bigger than any books that I've worked on previously. So they, they take up a lot more real estate in, in my head. Um, they're just bigger in terms of scope and complexity. So they take up more brain power. Um, so they take a little while longer to write. Before we get into the big boys here, I did get one from a series I had never heard of before someone asked me. Uh, Slasher Girls and Monster Boys? Is that one? Yeah. Uh, I just finished reading his short story, Sleepless, and I want to know, how he changes up his writing style so much. Everything I've read from him has a different tone to it. And I want to know if this is intentional or not. So Sleepless is a short story in an anthology. Um, okay. And it's almost entirely text. It's like two people texting each other. Um, I mean, in terms of style, I, I try to do something different every time. Um, and that can be as simple as inserting footnotes in Nevernight, like to try and kind of, the intention of the footnotes in Never Night, they're doing a bunch of different things. But one of the intentions is to break fourth wall. It's kind of like Deadpool-ish. Like the narrator is talking to you, the reader. And as the series goes on, you kind of understand why. It's a bit of a spoiler to talk about it. Um, but I was trying to mess with the with the structure and the fourth wall in that book. In Illuminae, we were doing a bunch of different stuff typographically and graphically that you don't see very often. Um, in Empire, I do the illustrations. So I'm always trying to do something that messes with the idea of what a book can be because structurally the object of a book hasn't changed a hell of a lot in kind of the last five, 600 years. A book is a book. Um, and there's pretty rigid parameters in the way that they work. So I'm trying to work within the boundaries of that to do something as different as I possibly can. Sometimes that's structural, sometimes that's, aesthetic and sometimes it's just the way that I write the story so sleepless was was kind of an experiment in that sense to see if I could tell a story just in text messages um yeah but I'm a bit of a wanker I, I try and do something, <laughs> Horror short story try, and do, fun. try and do something special every time <laughs> all right let's move on to never night here because I got this and empire obviously got the most questions uh sure this one uh kind of similar story told earlier I don't really have a question for Jay I would appreciate if you could pass on to him though that it was his book, Never Night, that six years ago when I was fresh out of a 12-month stint in rehab that got me reading again. And I have zero doubts wow. that my rediscovery of reading and my love for fantasy has been a major factor in me staying on the level and fixing up my life. So if you could just say from the bottom of my heart, thank you to Jay for the book from both me and my kids. Wow, that's awesome. That's, um, yeah, that's the cool stuff. That's what, that's what I was talking about before. Um, it's, it's one of the best part of my job. And I get that, I get letters like that a lot, particularly with Nevernight. Um, there's something about that character that resonates with people who are sometimes going through hard times. And yeah, it, it's an incredible privilege and a blessing to, to hear something like that. The idea that characters that live inside my head have meant so much to people who had to help them through real life. Like, yeah, that's awesome. So, so thanks and, you know, blessings on you and yours and i'm i'm really glad that the books helped that's that's really cool thanks yeah we're definitely not on the same level but when i get people to tell me i've influenced them to start reading again i mean that's yeah that's the greatest that's the greatest that's, that's what I, awesome that's what i do yeah too. it's great i mean that, that's one of the things i love about writing ya as well like ya can be a gateway to other things mm -hmm. yeah to to readers discovering reading for for a lifetime like one of the we're talking about twilight before like whether those books are your jam or not, one of the incredible things that they did was bring a generation of people to reading. Like, I, I guarantee you there's a massive percentage of the people, the ladies who read my stuff, because my, my readership is probably 70, 80% female. I guarantee you there's a massive chunk of them who started reading because of Twilight. So, you know, whether those books are not, they were your jam or not, they served as gateways into a, into a lifetime of being a fan of spec fix. So, yeah, you got to, you got to give Stephanie Meyer props for that. But yeah, it, it's awesome to hear something like that. Um, yeah, 
Now the criticism stuff. How does he deal sure. with all the controversial reviews on his Nevernight book and overall writing about heavier topics? Now, I think this was, don't want to cut you off, but this is where I said where people had read your YA stuff and they went into this expecting me YA and they were like, oh my God, you know? So how did you deal? Because I've, I've read some of the Goodreads reviews and I'm like, Jesus. Yeah. So uh, how did you deal with all that? I mean, you don't. You don't, you don't, you don't fuck with Goodreads reviews, man. You don't go there. <laughs> um, like it's, it's, first of all, it's not a, it's not a place for authors. Like it's a, it's a place for readers. So you're, you have no business being there, but you learn very quickly to accept that not all books are for all people. Um, and that, you know, you can't please all people all the time. But one of the cool things because there, there are some people who fucking hate Nevernight, uh, hate it. One of the coolest things that I, I had a conversation recently with a reader who said, I read all the one-star reviews on Goodreads and that's what made me buy the book. <laughs> like, so the, th so the things that somebody ha hates, someone else will love. Um, and you know, that, that's, just, that's just the game. Like, that's the cost of doing business. You put your work out there, you're going to find people who don't like it. Some people aren't shy about sharing those opinions, but there's no sense in engaging with any of it because A, it's one, it's not your place. And B, you don't, you know, nothing really good comes of it. Mm. Um, you have to focus on the positive. Like creating art is hard enough as it is without inundating yourself in negativity. So you surround yourself with people who are honest, like my crit partners and my editors, you know, they, they don't tell me that I'm awesome. Uh, they tell me the truth and you kind of find people that you rely on when you're creating your work, people that you trust, people are going to shoot straight with you and you put it out there in the world and, and see what people think. Um, negativity is, is just part of the game. Uh, if you spend much time online in 2021, there's an awful lot of negativity. So most authors I know don't really engage with that anymore. Like no author I know is really on Twitter anymore. Twitter seems to be a, a pretty uh, I got rid of money now as a general rule. Yeah. It's not a great place, man. Um, and no author that I know really engages over there. Uh, yeah, you you just have to accept it as part of doing business um, and you focus on the positive. Like, like I say, I, I, you know, I could spend my time reading bad reviews or I could look at pictures of people who have carved my words into their skin for life. Like, what are you going to draw more for them? Uh, what, what are you going to be more fulfilled by? So yeah, you just you just accept it as a cost of doing business and roll on with it. And like I say, it's cool that that some one star reviews actually drive people to read the books. I uh, absolutely, I was going to tell you that <laughs> honestly, for me, if I see a book causing a lot of outrage, it's kind of like maybe this comes from me being like, okay, well, this book just got banned. That means it's worth me reading. You know, I got to sure. figure it out. So when I'm seeing a big outrage, I told this to Mark Lawrence uh, when he was talking about the the outrage he got for Broken Empire. And he was saying, yeah, right. the outrage Prince machine got me, made me so many sales. <laughs> so he told me. Sure. So when I see stuff like that, I'm like, well, I'm going to give it a shot just because of that. So there we go. Yeah, so there, it's there a, is. A bad thing. I mean, there's the old adage that all publicity is good publicity. Uh -huh. um, yeah, uh, there, there's a great line from a Bring Me the Horizon song. Oli Sykes, like one day poet, he says, when all is said and done, my name's still on your tongue. So mm -hmm. like people out there talking shit, it's all good. They're still talking. All right. Um, and there, there's far more positivity than there is negativity. Like never has been an incredible series in that respect. Like I get letters like the one that you just read all the time. So I would much rather focus on something like that. Absolutely. Than somebody who didn't get what they want. Like, that's all cool. Um, this was kind of long. It, you kind of touched on it a little bit before. But in Nevernight, there seems to be an emphasis on Italian history, politics, tiles, architecture, style, etc. How do you capture the essence, the essence of a place and time? Do you just plan this or just see something from Italy's past or present that made you think of the setting and how much research goes into it? I mean, I'm a, I'm a massive history buff. Uh, and ancient Rome is one period and place in time that I'm particularly passionate about. So I just, I just drew on, I mean, I'd essentially been researching for Nevernight all my life. Like the, the Julian dynasty is one of the things that I can talk about at a dinner party with absolute authority, very boring dinner party, but like <laughs> that and Marvel comics are like the two things that I'm an authority on. So yeah, I, I just drew on one, a more useful thing to say is probably one of the things that you would do well to cultivate as a fantasy author is 
to have a knowledge of real world history because there's weirder stuff that has happened in real life than you can possibly think of in your head. Like no matter how bizarre a story you can think up, there's something weirder that happened in reality. Mm. Uh, and you can see there's a lot of fantasy authors who do this, you know, Game of Thrones is essentially War of the Roses with Dragons. Um, and that like, as far as a pitch for a book series goes, that's pretty killer. Like yeah, my attention. Yeah. Your, yeah, exactly. Um, but like uh, understanding how empires rise and fall, understanding how, even even something as simple as you know siege warfare works, um, how famous sieges have famous cities have been won and lost over the years. Like that stuff is just really interesting to me, um, and I love Italy as a country as well. Like me and my wife got married in Rome. If I could live anywhere in the world other than Australia, I'd live in Italy. So I kind of let all that just bleed into the narrative. And like I say, I lived in Venice for like a month, month and a half while I was writing in Dark Dawn just to kind of fully immerse myself in it. But yeah, it's just kind of a lifelong love that that bled into the book. Um, and I drew on kind of real world historical events as well. Like Julius Caesar, um, he had a wife and daughter. And so one of the things that started never night in my head was a thought experiment. Like what would have happened to Julius's family if his rebellion against the Republic had failed? And that kind of set some of me as personal history and family background, kind of solidified that in my head. So yeah. Drawing on real world history and having a knowledge of real world history is it's a really valuable tool for fantasy authors to have. That sounds awesome. Uh, so what was your inspiration to write Mia Corvair? Am I saying it right? Corvair? Uh, depends. I, I think the Italian pronunciation is Corvair. Corvair. Okay. But I, you know, yeah. Um, the inspiration for Mia, it's a, it's a weird story. She initially got born... I was at a New Year's Eve party like years and years ago and I watched two lady friends of mine, like not lady friends, just friends who are ladies, okay. um, having a drunken argument about the word cunt <laughs> and, whether, and whether it was offensive or not. And one argued for and one argued against. And I, I stayed out of that argument. I just kind of listened to it. Uh, but I went away a few days later and I wrote a scene uh, in which a boy and a girl were having a similar conversation. And at the end of that scene, I wanted to know who this girl was. Like, I didn't know who she was, um, but I kind of liked the way she thought. And so I wrote a book to find out who she was, and that that was Mia. And that was Nevernight. So, yeah, she, she was born out of a drunken conversation on New Year's Eve. Aesthetically, she's kind of based on, there's a character named Emily the Strange, which was like a, she's like a cartoon character that a lot of, goth folks would be familiar with she's this girl with kind of long black hair and a fringe and she always has black cats around her so visually speaking i kind of aged her up in my head and gave her a broadsword and that was where mia's visual iconography was born but yeah character she was a drunken argument on new year's eve that might be the <laughs> best origin story i've heard for a character in a while that's yeah i mean like that, that's <laughs> it goes back to what i was saying before like just open yourself up to new experiences hang out with weird people and go and do strange things because you never know where a cool idea could come from i think i know the answer to this one because you talked about your your crit group that is all females here uh have you sure. read any harlequin romance books because your sex scenes get quite steamy <laughs> no, I've never read Harlequin Romance. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm glad you think they're steamy. That's cool. Uh, some people don't like them. Some of the one star reviews on Goodreads go on at length how much they, they suck. But uh, yeah, I, I get a lot of ladies talking to me about that um, and being complimentary about that, which is cool. Uh, when I was initially planning on doing those scenes, I had my wife who is probably the most well-read person I know. And she does read a lot of romance. She and her friends got kind of a compilation for me together of their like greatest hits, like the best scenes in all the, fan, in all the romances that they read. And they bookmarked them all and color coded them like green for FF and blue for MM and pink for MF and whatever else. <laughs> and there was this massive stack of filth on my coffee table and I just sat there for days and just read erotica basically kind of studying how everything was done I had a mate text me in the middle of it. he's like hey man what are you up to today I'm like brother you wouldn't believe me if I told you because <laughs> uh, I didn't want I didn't want to do a bad job like I hadn't done it before and I wanted to understand how they work so I guess my training ground was entirely in books written by women um, and I, I kind of 
bring a male sensibility to it. But like I say, probably 70, 80% of the people who read my books, at least up until now, have been ladies. I've, I've noticed there is a creep of dudes into my readership now that I've brought out Empire. Um, yeah, kind of people who read more traditional fantasy are kind of discovering now because of Empire. But prior to that, it was mostly ladies who read my stuff and I, I didn't want to mess it up. So I went, I went to romance school <laughs> thanks to my wife. Um, I think that might have been yeah, a... went from there. That might have been kind of a shot at me because I'm famous for I, I lost a bet with my wife and I had to read some of her Harlequin romance novels live. On oh, the, yeah. Yeah. So did, did, it, did it work out? <laughs> it was weird. Uh, I'll say that the comments right. in that video were some of the weirdest I've ever got. But uh, I mean, I, I didn't I didn't read the whole book. I, I just read the I read the good bits. That's great. That they <laughs> read researched the it for you and color coded it and everything. Yeah. Man, they were on it. They took it seriously. Took this it person seriously. wants to know about all the sneaky Nevernight teases you've been posting on social media. Media. is there an adaptation coming no we just talked about it so there's a there's a box set that's coming out next year um there's a company called lit joy crate in the states who are doing oh, like a, like a yeah like a luxury edition uh, and we've been working on it for a few months so i've been posting snippets on my instagram and stuff so that is going on sale in march we just announced it this week i think and they look gorgeous like it, they are going to be beautiful books. So if you're an Evernight fan or you're looking to get into the series, it's a pretty good opportunity. There's a, there's a bunch of incredible illustrations throughout and I have annotated the books as well. I just kind of write notes in the margins talking well, about it, what the inspiration for the scene was. Or, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the like, spines oh, match as well. I get that one so, now, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like the definitive edition. So that's coming out in, I think, March. And I know you get this a lot. Have you been approached about an adaptation for Never Night? There are discussions happening. In the and you said there are things you can't but, talk about, so I figured it might be something like that. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things you can't talk about until you can. And then as soon as you can, you kind of yell from the rooftops about yeah. it. Um, so yeah, there are, there are discussions happening, but I, I can't say any more. Uh, we'll leave it at there is interest. Okay, so what is your sure. pitch for reading Never Night to people who liked Empire of the Vampire? How would I pitch it? Um, man, it's been a while since I, I did the spiel for Nevernight. It's set in a it's set in a land where the sun's never set. It's a trinary star system. So there's three suns in the sky, and one or more of them are in the sky at all times. So there's only nighttime once every two and a half years, and that goes for two weeks at a stretch, and then it's just day constantly. Um, it's inspired by ancient Roman and Merchant Prince Venice. So it has that kind of Italian aesthetic to it. And it's about a young girl whose father leads a rebellion against the Republic and is executed for it. A family are killed and she falls under the wing of a former assassin who kind of takes her in and schools her in the arts, subtle arts of murder and persuasion. Uh, so she can avenge herself against the people who killed her parents. So it's a, it's kind of grim, dark, epic fantasy. Um, it's bloody. It's kind of smutty. It's sweary. It's stabby. Uh, if you like Empire, it, Empire was kind of the spiritual successor to Nevernight. So the aesthetics of it um, and the sensibilities of it are very similar. Like em, Empire is kind of Nevernight's big brother. Me, bloody and stabby, I'm in. Uh, I'm in. Bloody and smutty and stabby. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, let's talk about it. Has has I think that's the <laughs> the one that has the, uh, the the most interest right now. Uh, sure. The, obviously, the big question, and and I know I'm I, I don't like to be this guy when the book just came out. When's when book would, do we expect the next vampire uh, Empire of the Vampire book? Because I need it now, please. Um, I'm writing it now. It'll it'll probably be 2023. Um. Well, it will be 2023. It, it won't be next year um, because they're big books, like I say. I was about to say, is it going to be as big as this one? So, yeah. It'll, it'll be bigger, probably. Bigger. Like oh. book, books tend to creep by about 10%, or my books do anyway. So it'll be a little bit longer. Uh, I'm planning illustrations with Bond now, and they'll probably be 40 rather than 36. So that's, in, that's the kind of size creep that we're planning on. Um, so yeah, we're looking at 2023 at this stage because um, I'm still writing it now. Like I say, they're, they're bigger and more complex than anything that I've done before. So they, they take a little more time writing, but uh, it's going good. Like book two is, 
it's same but different. Um, book two has two POVs rather than one. Mm-hmm. So there is another prisoner in the tower with Gabe uh, and you get someone else's perspective on what is happening in the world and what Gabe has told you so far. Because, you know, it's, it's first person narrative. So you're only getting his point of view. You're only getting his opinion and his interpretation of events. And obviously he's he's kind of skewed in one direction. So the things that he has told us might not be 100% true. See, now that's Maybe got that. me that's got me Vampire Lestat feeling right now. I'm like, oh, so Louis was maybe a little bit of an unreliable narrator, so to speak. So uh. I mean, everybody is, right? Like yeah. you, when you when you tell a story, um, you bring your own perspectives and prejudices and perceptions to it. Like if I tell a story about a fight that I got into on Friday night at the pub, the guy I fought is probably going to tell a different version of events. Um, so yeah, that that that's the cool thing about first person narration. You can kind of you can kind of mess with the idea that people misremember, people lie, uh, and people just perceive things differently depending on who they are and how they've lived. So yeah, that there, there is a touch of that for sure. All right, I like it's it. Fun. No, that's yeah. awesome. I, I mean, another question I got to give. This is you already answered. You said this is going to be a trilogy, correct? Yeah, yeah. It's planned for a trilogy. Yeah. You like to work in just trilogies, really? I mean, is that like what you plan to do for most of your anything you have planned? Is that yeah, pretty much. Um, I have one idea in my head that's kind of a standalone, but I like trilogies. I mean, it's it's kind of traditional fantasy structure, it's traditional Western storytelling structure, good kind of three act structure. Well, I miss um, trilogies. Everybody now is like, it's book one of nine. I'm like, nine, you jeez. Nine nine's a lot. Um yeah. and I can understand why people do that. Like the idea to tell something that sprawling and that that much scope and ambition, it, it gives you a lot of room to play. Um, but it, it's also incredibly difficult to do well. It's incredibly difficult for a story to maintain integrity over nine, nine books. Um, I'm not sure I have that skill level to tell you the truth. <laughs> so I kind of plan with trilogies in mind in terms of, you know, I'll have the first book kind of solidified in my head and have a vague idea of where book two and three are going to finish. Um, that's just the way my brain works. So yeah, traditionally trilogies is where I'm at. And again, same deal. Empire of the Vampire being such a big success. Have any streamers or movie studios been uh, been ringing you up, ringing your bell lately? Uh, can't talk about that. There's there is really cool stuff happening. That's all I can say. Outstanding. Well, hey, if <laughs> there's anything that hopefully. Hopefully we'll get to we'll have more news next year. I'll tell you, yeah, if anything will make you write faster, I think it would be that, right? <laughs> yeah, sure, exactly. Yeah, you don't want you don't want the series to lap the books. Hey, George R. R. Martin, uh, where did you get the inspiration <laughs> for the French Gothic vibes? Because Empire of the Vampire had the most vivid setting I've experienced in years. Oh, cool! Thanks. Um, I mean, aesthetically, one of the big influences was the movie called Brotherhood of the Wolf. I don't know if you've seen it. I French know film. the name, but I haven't watched it. Yeah. It's an amazing film. Uh, it's a French film set in 1800s in, in rural France. It's about the Beast of Gévaudan. Um And aesthetically, that was kind of one of the influences that I first drew on. Like, like I say, I'm a visually minded person. So when I'm planning a new series, I almost have, it's weird to describe, I almost have like a visual scrapbook in my head. I'll have fragments of imagery that I kind of collate together and, and thread into a tapestry. And some of the visual aesthetic and iconography kind of comes from Brotherhood of the Wolf. So that was where the idea of um, drawing on French etymology and French naming conventions and having a French inspired colonial power kind of dominating the continent that the book is set on. Like in in the second book we travel, the, the idea that I was trying to impart Elidane, which is the country that has taken over the continent, they are in the East. And so the further west you get, the less of Elidani culture you get. Like they're intensely colonial, but just through the tyranny of proximity, the further away you are from the center of power, the more local cultures are going to be retaining some sense of themselves. So in the second book, we spend a lot of time in the west of the continent. And that's that's in a place called Osway, which is inspired by Scots Gaelic culture. So there's a lot more of that that kind of bleeds through in the world building. But in terms of the central country and particularly to the east, yeah. The, the main inspiration was kind of that French aesthetic. Um, but a lot of that comes down to conversation with Bon as well, the illustrator. Um, like she kind of loves that sense of fashion as well. So 
I wanted to invite her in in terms of some of the aesthetics because I wanted her to feel like she was a partner rather than just a hired hand. So some of her sensibilities kind of bled into the aesthetics of the world as well. Yeah, I did have that question, which you kind of already answered. Is how closely did you work with the illustrator? Were these because I've seen a lot of these people will tell me, like even for their covers, was like they'll say, "Okay, well, I, I kind of had this idea," and then they get the the, the, the print back, and it's like that's not what I imagined at all. But I guess that's what we're going with. So it sounds like you guys actually worked pretty close together on it. Yeah, um, in terms of the interior illustrations, definitely. Yeah, um, the covers I had some input on as well uh, because I used to be a designer by trade, and so my editors have learned that I actually know what I'm talking about. Like most authors who don't have a background in design will still have very strong feelings about the covers, uh, but they're not actually basing that on any real life experience. Whereas I used to do that stuff for a living. So I can, I can shoot ideas back and forth with the cover designer, with the illustrator and kind of talk in their language. But yeah, as far as the illustrators go, I would, I would kind of clip a, a paragraph from the narrative and shoot at the bond she would kind of send me a couple of sketches back and forth. And if there was any kind of visual inspiration that I had drawn from like a, a wardrobe or a castle or whatever, I would kind of send her those visual cues as well. And then I would just kind of leave her to it. Like one of the things that I learned when I was working in ads, if you're working with a talented person, be it a photographer or an illustrator or a director or whatever, the best thing you can do is stay the fuck out of their way and let them do their job. So that's kind of what I did with Bond. I would give her a loose brief and then just let her go and she would do what she wanted to do and Did she would she, do she would kind of keep me well? on the loop no that's that's by the illustrator is a guy named kirby rosanis um and the designer is michaela alcano i think that's how it's pronounced i'm sorry michaela if i mispronounced that uh yeah so that that was a kind of collaboration between the three of us kirby kind of started sending me sketches and i would give him ideas as to what I, kind of iconography he could lean on um, sometimes I'd jump in and Photoshop and, and mess with a little bit. Um, like I put the shield in the middle. Originally there was a figure there. I think there was like Gabriel holding a sword. And so I kind of came up with the idea of putting the shield in the middle and having the title be hero. Um, uh, because some people just see the word vampire and pick it up because they love vampires. I'm kind mm -hmm. of the same way. Um, so yeah, that, that was kind of a collaborative process as well. And then most authors don't get to do that. I'm very lucky that I get to do that that kind of comes with having worked with the same editors for a long time. And I think also just having a background in kind of visual arts and design, I can, I can be a little more analytical about stuff than maybe other authors can. So I'm very lucky to get included early on in the process. Yeah, it's not very often I'll uh, wait for a book to be shipped for a month just to get a better cover, but this cover is so much better than the U S one. I love this to death. It's, it's I wish I got Kirby, the same amazing. too, but I, I think those were very limited. Those are going on eBay for quite a, pretty penny right now so it's like i think i'll be okay with just this uk edition <laughs> so. yeah they 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 sold out super quick um yeah it, it, it kind of comes back to that amazing nevernight fandom that i talked about before like everyone was kind of super excited right, so about I, have to, I have to be on my pre-order game for book two to make sure that uh yeah like, they, 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 they went they went pretty editions. quick, quick. there were a lot of special editions but they all sold out so um i guess my publishers knew what they were doing but right. kirby did the uh, nevernight illustrations as well um and he was nice enough to send me the originals of the of the crow and the wolf and the cat they're hanging up on wall just above my screen he's a lovely dude very talented after reading the chapter the worst day of empire the <laughs> empire how can he be so plainly evil <laughs> uh i don't That's know an amazing chapter i'm glad i'm glad you liked it uh that was probably the hardest thing i've ever written mm. that was the heaviest chapter i've ever written in my life and I was writing it right in the middle of COVID and we were kind of in the second lockdown in Melbourne. And so we, I had kind of all this existential darkness and I was also living through this awful dark moment in the book. I remember I finished writing that chapter and I kind of slammed the laptop shut, pushed it away. And I, I didn't touch that machine for like four days. I would just kind of walk past it in my living room and look at it, kind of like, you know what you did. Um, yeah, I mean, it's an incredibly dark moment. Uh, in a dark story, but it's formative. It, you know, the one of I hope one of the intriguing things about Empire is the contrast between young Gabe and old Gabe. Like you meet young Gabe, he's kind of idealistic and full of fire and the belief that he can change the world, and then you meet him 16 years later, and he's almost a completely different yeah, person. Jaded. Like he's yeah. jaded and bitter and broken, and he's a drug addict and 
he has no faith in anyone or anything. Hopefully one of the questions that you're asking is how did one become the other? Like what the fuck happened to this kid to make right. him into this man? I mean, that chapter is the answer. <laughs> so uh, I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad it hits hard. I'm not sure people enjoy it. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's probably not the I'm word, it, but yeah, I'm, it's right. Yeah, I'm glad it hits hard. Uh, it was it was really hard to write, but I'm really proud of the writing. Like, I mean, it's essentially a conversation between two people at a dinner table. Um, but ho- but hopefully it it's imbued with a sense of heaviness. Like I, I went and studied. There's a great scene at the start of Inglorious Bastards, the Quentin Tarantino film. Um, there's a scene between a Nazi and a French peasant who's hiding some Jewish people under his floorboards. And again, that's just a conversation at a dinner table. It goes for like 15 minutes. And it's one of the most tense scenes I've ever seen on cinema before. It's just two people talking at each other. Yeah. That's I kind of 10 minutes studied, of the movie, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, I kind of studied that scene and, and looked at the beats and looked at how Tarantino kind of did the things he did. So that was a really big influence for me. Now, before I read this, I said that Joe Abercrombie is the undisputed king of finding the correct combinations and modifiers for swear words. Well, I have to say, I think you knocked him off his perch. So this person wants to know, how do you come up with such creative cuss words? Because personally, it's hard for me now right now not to call my kids twat goblins and stuff like that. So, I mean, I, I love this stuff. I've been saying fuck my face a lot and stuff. So uh, these are great. These are fantastic. Is, Please is, never is stop. Twat- a word used in America very often. I thought not, that was not as much as cunt, but yeah, we, we, we right, okay. sometimes, right. sometimes more, more ironically than anything. So yeah. So anyway, <laughs> like I said, in my review, I was going to open the review with, you know, I always say what's up bookworms. And I asked something from the book and I was going to say twice. Right. Album. So I was like, people who haven't read this might be like, what the no context. <laughs> yeah, right. So, but yeah, it's great. So how, how do you, is this just years of like, you know, drinking, your drinking buddies or something in here? In probably. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the fact that I'm Australian probably helps as well. We, we tend to be quite profane. As are a, y'all potty mouths out there? Culture. Oh yeah, Australians okay. are terrible for it. Like Australians, Australians will call their friends cunts as a term of endearment. Oh sure. Like sure. you walk into the room and say, "Hey, cunts," and it, it's, it's just par for the course. So I have to, I have to learn to dial it down when I'm on tour, particularly in the states, because some Americans will take an enormous amount of offense at that word. Uh, you and you, they don't, they don't understand that it can be used as terms of affection. But yeah, it. It's kind of part of common parlance down here in Australia. So, and, and also in the UK to a lesser extent. So I, I think that's why Joe and I are so sweary. <laughs> oh, I, I love some people it. don't like it. So, some, I'm married some to a redhead like and she would make a say right. or some of the things he said. And I read some of these passages to her and she was like, Jesus. <laughs> so yeah, you, you're, you're hitting the right notes on that for sure. All right. I like to hear it. I like to hear it. All right, so you got a, you got big shoes to fill up book two on that one. Okay, so yeah, okay. This one, I I almost didn't want to ask this because I think it's kind of stupid. It's almost just become like a running joke on my Discord now. Is the Goodreads review that you did for Empire of the Vampire? Somebody wants to know sure. if that was review was meant to be satire because what does he have to say to people who were put off by that review? And I think I don't know if it's because of the Vampire Diaries thing that you put in there. I have no idea why it upset people so bad. So I don't, I didn't even know people were upset. Uh, um, I don't know why. Why? Why were they upset? I, I have no idea. I just think that they thought it was weird. I have no idea. I don't. I, I guess they I didn't know. expect every author to be like, okay, here's my super professional review of my own book, kind of thing. Yeah, and, sure. Okay. Uh, I mean, self-deprecation is an intrinsic part of Australian uh, sense of humor. Really, yeah. um, we take the piss out of ourselves. We don't take this shit seriously, or at least we try not to. We have a thing in this country called tall poppy syndrome. I don't know if you guys have that in the States. The idea is that the tall poppy, the poppy that grows up above the rest of the poppies gets cut the fuck down to size. Hmm. So if you're Australian you're, you, and you're successful, you make sure you are the first person to take the piss out of yourself because otherwise people will just decide you're an asshole. Um, so yeah, maybe that's the, that sense of self-deprecation. Like I, I I, d- I don't want to be the super serious fantasy guy. Like I write stories about assassin girls and vampires for fuck's sake. Like how serious about that shit can you be? Like I'm, I'm, I'm not curing cancer here. I'm not silver bulleting nuclear fusion. Like I write stories about vampires. I, I, I write, I write epic fantasy. Like 
you can't take that shit too seriously. I think if you do take it seriously, you're probably doing yourself a disservice. So yeah, maybe, maybe that maybe that sense of humor comes across wrong to people who don't get it. I don't know, um, but you can but be yourself. I would I would rather I would rather people dislike me for the person that I am than love me for the person that I am not. Right on. See, now I think I might have some uh, unbeknownst to me, I might have some Australian blood because I love bad language and I I am the right. king of self deprecating humor because it's like, look, guys. I put myself out there publicly with this face. I got to do something <laughs> to get out in front of these people who just want to insult my face. Right. So I'm always right. doing the self-deprecating humor. It kind of, like you said, takes the piss out of everything where everybody's like, Oh, okay, well I can just, you know, I don't know what I can say to top what he just said about himself. So I guess now I'll actually listen to what he has to say about this book. Yeah, sure. Sure. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I have no, I have noticed that Texas do tend to be quite sweary. I've, I've been to Texas like three or four times. I have noticed there truly there is, is God's country. Yes, there there is there is a kinship between Australians and Texans that maybe you don't find in a place like New York. So, I know you brought this up about the Suns here. Now, is Empire of the Vampire somehow tied or complementary to the world of Nevernight? Where is the sun never rises in one, and in the other one, the sun almost never sets? No, it was just there was just kind of coincidence. Like I wanted to. In, in terms of world building, I wanted humanity to be on the back foot in Empire, and I needed to think of a paradigm shift that would make that possible. So taking away one of the banes that kept vampires in check up until that point was the most logical way to do that. And, you know, my vampires are traditional folklorish vampires in the sense that daylight kills them. Um, so taking daylight away was the one thing that kind of, that started the, that was the event that started the fall. So, you know, it, it was just, it's purely coincidence. I've had a couple of people say that, like, you, you like messing with, with daylight um, or nighttime. But no, it was, it was just the most logical way that I could think to put humanity on the back foot. Like, limitations in the way vampires can move around the country is still really important. Like, they can't cross running water. So I had to pay a great deal of attention to where I put the rivers in terms of the geography. Like, I spent more time on that map than any map that I have ever done in any series that I've ever developed. But yeah, daylight was the one thing that was kind of holding them back. So taking that away was, was the way to unleash them. If you can't say, I understand, but is day's death going to be answered? In, like what caused it? Is it going to be answered in book two, or is this going to be like a mystery through the whole series? Um, there are certainly theories about it. Uh, and those theories start to come to light in book two. So you find out a little bit more about, the lore of vampires i guess like you're again in book one you're only getting gabe's perceptions and gabe was kind of indoctrinated by a religious order when he was a young man so he only sees the world through one point of view uh and he's not fully privy to all the secrets like vampires as a society have existed for hundreds and hundreds of years so in book two you start to get a peek behind that curtain and get a bit of a better look in the way that vampire politics and society works because some of these things have known each other for centuries and they have, you know, petty rivalries and old bad romances and, and grudges that they've held onto for hundreds and hundreds of years. So there's a lot more complexity going on in the background that Gabe is kind of privy to in book one and the origins of day's death and kind of the law behind that. You start to get a look at that in book two. Now, speaking of theories, we got some ones on the whole is the grail actually the grail kind of thing? We got all these long theories going on in the discourse, so I can't wait to, to see what you do there. Oh, that's cool. I'm, I'm see how glad, long I'm we glad. actually all are. It's going to be great. <laughs> so let's see if we can break some news here. Do you have a title for book two yet? I have a working title, but I don't know if it's going to stick. Oh. I have a couple that are kind of bouncing around in my head, but um, yeah, I don't know if any of them will stick at this point. I I tend to know the right title when I find it and I'm not sure I found it yet. So um, I'll wait till I finish writing it and then, and then kind of lock it in. Like Nevernight as a title, that was one of the last things to happen in the book. Like that book took me 18 months to think of a title for. So sometimes the title can be the hardest part of it. Okay, guys, I tried. Here we go. Uh, so you said you like to be like a cinematic writer. You like to kind of picture the movie in your head. So have you pictured uh, any actors or actresses to play some of these characters in your head? Sometimes um, when I'm imagining scenes, I will, I will put, yeah, I'll sometimes put an actor I know in them, but I, I, I try not to limit myself in that sense. Um, yeah. In, in terms of the visuals that I see in my head, it's not like it's photo real. Um, it's probably like 80% fidelity. So I don't usually put faces on characters or anything like that. 
but sometimes I will get inspired by actors that I've watched, actresses that I've watched or scenes that I've watched. So there's a, there was a great um, TV series a few years back called True Detective by Nick Pizzolatto, mm-hmm. which is a lot of that series is essentially an interview. It's like a couple of guys sitting at a table talking to each other, telling a life story. So I kind of, I, I leaned on some of those characterizations and some of those narrative beats. But yeah, I, I try not to lock myself in because that, that's kind of closing yourself off to possibility. All right, guys, you heard it. Matthew and, McConaughey is Gabe. You just heard it. You just heard it right here. Yeah, sure. He's a little bit old, <laughs> but sure. Uh, I don't know if you've, you've read all these series or know these, but someone wants to know, oh, this is just some general vampire questions. Now, of these characters, which is your favorite? Abel Night Road from Trinity Blood, Alucard from Helsing, or D from Vampire Hunter D. See, I don't watch anime, so I know at least two of those are anime series. I've not heard of the first one. I own so, Helsing, uh, but I've never read it, so I don't, I don't have any of these. No, I, I, I'm, I'm not a huge anime fan, so sorry, I don't have an answer for that one. Have what you would, ever what? played the Legacy of Cain series, video game series? Yeah, I have. I played... <sighs> I think I played the Soul Reaver, I think it was called, uh, on PS2. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that was that was a cool kind of old... I actually brought story. this up, because there's a line you use in your book, I think it's uh, Danton, who says, you know, call your dogs, they can feast upon your corpses. I'm like, hey, that's a line straight out from the first Legacy of Cain game, which could be, it's not like it's that unheard of. And I was like, I wonder if he's played this game series before. I don't think I played the first one. I played the second one with Raziel. Like Kane Raziel, Kid, yeah. Mm-hmm. Where he gets his rings ripped off. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, I, play, I played that one. I, pl- I played that on PS2. I think the first one was older than that, though, right? That was yeah, it was the original PlayStation, yeah. Oh, right, PS1. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I didn't play that one. But uh, yeah, I played Soul Reaver and the one after that, I can't remember. But yeah, no. If I if I stole their line, then that was purely coincidence. No, it's it's, it's, it's a great line. I mean, that's how I heard it in my head. <laughs> cool. So I was like, hey, this is awesome. Uh, this person is interested to know what your favorite vampire movie is. Near Dark, uh, Near Dark or The Lost Boys. Lost One of those. Boys. Two. I showed that to my uh, to my nine year old for the first time this year. He loved it. Yeah. So he yeah, I knew I was in trouble because uh, when I saw that as a kid, I was. I was rooting for the vampires rather than the, <laughs> well, the I mean, it's Keeper Sutherland. It's the coolest cat yeah, in the right? world. Yeah. I, I grew a mullet because of that guy. He was so cool. Um, At least didn't go get a saxophone. Yeah, near, near Dark is also amazing. That's Catherine Bigelow's first feature film. She's the lady who directed Zero Dark Thirty and Hurt Locker, I think. Um, and it's about a bunch of redneck vampires driving around the South in an RV. with like They put up aluminum foil over the windows during the day and stuff. It's got Bill Paxton in it. It's got Lance Hendricks yeah, in it. It's um, like a James bunch Cameron's, of James, James, Cameron's James Cameron alumni. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if she was married to James Cameron, Catherine Bigelow. But yeah, it's super cool. It's kind of like this, this weird kind of almost new gothic, low scale hillbilly vampire story. It, it's awesome. It's a super cool new take on vampires. It kind of stripped away all the veneer of romance and aristocracy and stuff that Anne Rice did and just said like what what would happen if a bunch of just average people got turned into vampires like what and, the, and they've had a hundred years to run around like what would they be doing it, well Bill Paxton's cool. an automatic watch for me so sure man oh, if you yeah. haven't seen Near Dark you no, should I check haven't. it out it's great there's a there's a great line in there there that they're like beating up a bunch of oh, they, they light some petrol station on fire and Bill Paxton says to Lance Henriksen hey Jesse, do you remember that fire we started in Chicago? Oh. Like this, it's, and that's all that's said about it. Like, it's just this great throwaway one. It's, oh, man, that's so cool. Yeah, it's a, it's a super great film. I like a little humor in my vampire stories. Uh, favorite modern vampire story? You can't choose Empire of the Vampire. Man, what would it be? Because personally, it's been since the 90s since I liked the vampire story. So, yeah for this one i mean i'm gonna go with vampire diaries i love vampire diaries like it's it's not it's certainly not what i write um it's it's aesthetically very have you read the books though no i haven't i've only watched the show um and my wife and i have started watching the spin-off series the originals which Mm kind of deals with a bunch of the older vampire villains they kind of they get their own spin-off series um like i say if if you're if you are a spec fic writer you could do far worse than study 
the beats and structure of that show. Julie Pleck and Rebecca Sun and Shine are on it. They're very, very smart ladies. And my last question, best vampire of all time. And, and how hard are you going to try to not make it Dracula or Barlow? I, <laughs> I, I'm going to go with Claudia, man, from interview. She's my fave. She's amazing. Right. Like yeah. she's the catalyst that makes that whole story run. Uh, and it's a super cool idea as well. Like conceptually, the idea of a grown person trapped in the body of a child mm. and just eternally furious at the limitations that places on them. Like there's something really cool about that as a thought, but the way she influences that story, like interview is a true love triangle, like Louis Lestat and Claudia all love and hate each other at various points mm. in that novel. But her arrival is kind of catalyst that sets everything in motion. She's yeah, she's, she's great. She's just this engine of, of rage uh, and chaos that drives the whole story forward. So yeah, I love it. Even though she's only there for a little while, like a couple of hundred pages conceptually she's just great and in terms of the job that she does in the narrative she's super cool yeah i've probably read that book about 25 times when i was in high school that was like this is what a vampire book should be reading and right it's amazing yeah so, yeah so it was it was a big loss that we lost i the was quite week, crushed so. by it i yes, really really was cheers to lady anne she was amazing well, I appreciate like, you spending like, two hours here talking with me of this stuff. This is great. Wow, it's been two hours. Okay. Yeah, wow. most 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 there people are like, yeah, I'll talk to you for about thirty minutes or so. So, uh, this is great. I didn't expect you to take this much time to do that. I didn't expect yeah, you to man. respond honestly. Well, I was like, oh, this guy's pretty big time. I don't know if he's gonna want to talk to me. No, no, I, I I love talking about it. and yeah, it's it's um it's cool to see the book kind of getting out to new audiences and yeah. stuff. That was one of the intents behind Empire, like to to get out to a bunch of people. Uh, that maybe hadn't heard of me before so it, it's cool to see guys like you and, and folks on other youtube channels giving a shot and really liking it it's it's been amazing to watch the reception of it like i found out just last week that it, empire was the number one selling fantasy hardback in the united kingdom for the entire year like wow that just blows me away man like, it blows me away so for you and everyone out there who's kind of spreading the love of the book and talking about it and and telling their friends about it like it's one thing to have great publishers behind me and i do but no book is successful without readership and so for everyone out there who's talking about it like seriously thank you because you do more than you will ever know and i'm incredibly grateful for it well i thank you like i said in my review i've been waiting for an adult author to take back this genre for <laughs> adults again and i feel like it's finally happening so i'm hoping that other publishers will be like, hmm, there's actually a market for people who aren't 15 that want to read about this stuff. So sure, uh, sure. I'm being I'm being very selfish. I want this genre. I want vampires <laughs> to be horrifying again. That's what I want. I want them out for blood constantly. As Spike would say in Buffy, I want them treating their humans like happy meals. Okay. That's what I want. Right. To do. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm here bring, for it. bring back evil. Bring back evil. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much. And uh, I, I guess we'll uh, uh, maybe we'll talk again after I'm done with these. Yeah, man. All right, that'd be great, and I will. Uh, I will send you some Dan Rex because yeah, you, you gotta you gotta up your game. I'll send I you can't wait. I can't wait. All right, <laughs> thank you, sir. Have a good All right, night. man. Have a merry Christmas. Uh, take care. Thanks, Likewise. everyone.